those days, there was a great fever in the land, and a thirst for truth, and a hunger to understand what the Almighty meant by making this change in the fortunes of mankind. In those days in the South, there were many preachers who explained it. This is a punishment for sin. This is Satan walking amongst us. This is the sign of the end of days. But all these were not the true religion. For the true religion is love, not fear. The strong mother cradling her child, that is love, and that is truth. The girls pass this news from one to the next to the next. God has returned, and her message is for us, only us. In the early morning of a day a few weeks later, there are more baptisms. It is the spring, near to Easter, the festival of eggs and fertility and the opening of the womb, Mary's festival. When they come from the water, they do not care to hide what has happened to them, nor could they if they tried. By breakfast, all the girls know, and all of the nuns. Eve sits under a tree in the garden, and the other girls come to talk to her. They say, What shall we call you? And Eve says, I am only the messenger of the mother. They say, But is the mother in you? And Eve says, She is in all of us. But even still, the girls begin to call her Mother Eve. That night, there is a great debate between the nuns of the Sisters of Mercy. Sister Maria Ignatia, who the others note is a particular friend of that girl, Eve, speaks in favor of the new organization of beliefs. It is just the same as it has always been, she says. The mother and the son, it is just the same. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the queen of heaven. It is she who prays for us now and at the hour of our death. Some of these girls had never been baptized. They have taken it into their heads to baptize themselves. Can this be wrong? Sister Catherine speaks of the Marian heresies and the need to wait for guidance. Sister Veronica hauls herself to her feet and stands, straight as the true cross, in the center of the room. The devil is in this house, she says. We have allowed the devil to take root in our breasts and make his nest in our hearts. If we do not cut the canker out now, we shall all be damned. She says it again, more loudly, casting her glance from woman to woman in the room. Damned! If we do not burn them as they burn these girls in Decatur and Shreveport, the devil will take us all. It shall be utterly consumed. She pauses. She is a powerful speaker. She says, I shall pray on it this night. I shall pray for you all. We will lock the girls in their rooms until dawn. We should burn them all. The girl who has been listening at the window brings this message to Mother Eve, and they wait to hear what she will say. The voice says, You've got them now, girl. Mother Eve says, let them lock us in. The Almighty will work her wonders. The voice says, Doesn't Sister Veronica realize that any of you could just open the window and climb down the drain pipe? And Ali says in her heart, It is the will of the Almighty that she has not realized it. The next morning, Sister Veronica is still at prayer in the chapel. At six, when the other sisters file in for vigils, she is there, prostrate before the cross, her arms outstretched, her forehead touching the cool stone tile. It is only when they lean forward to touch her arm gently that the women see that the blood has settled in her face. She has been dead for many hours. A heart attack the kind of thing that could happen at any moment to a woman of her age. And, as the sun rises, they look towards the figure on the cross, and they see that, engraved now into his flesh, traced with scored lines as if carved with a knife, are the fern-like markings of the power. 
and they know that Sister Veronica was taken in the moment that she witnessed this miracle, and so had repented of all her sin. The Almighty has returned as promised, and she dwells in human flesh again. This day is for rejoicing. There are messages from the Holy See calling for calm and order, but the atmosphere among the girls in the convent is such that no mere message could bring stillness. There is the feeling of a festival in the building. All the ordinary rules seem to have been suspended. The beds go unmade. The girls take what foods they want from the pantry without waiting for mealtimes. There is singing and the playing of music. There is a glitter in the air. By lunchtime, fifteen more girls have asked for the baptism, and by the afternoon they have received it. There are nuns who protest and say they'll call in the police, but the girls laugh and strike them with their jolts until they run away. In the late afternoon, Eve speaks to her congregation. They record it on their cell phones and send it across the world. Mother Eve wears a hood, the better to preserve her humility, for it is not her message she preaches, but the message of the mother. Eve says, Do not be afraid. If you trust, then God will be with you. She has overturned heaven and earth for us. They have said to you that man rules over woman as Jesus rules over the church. But I say unto you that woman rules over man as Mary guided her infant son, with kindness and with love. They have said to you that his death wiped away sin. But I say unto you that no one's sin is wiped away, but that they join in the great work of making justice in the world. Much injustice has been done, and it is the will of the Almighty that we gather together to put it right. They have said to you that man and woman should live together as husband and wife, but I say unto you that it is more blessed for women to live together, to help one another to band together and be a comfort one to the next. They have said to you that you must be contented with your lot, but I say unto you that there will be a land for us, a new country. There will be a place that God will show us where we will build a new nation, mighty and free. One of the girls says, But we can't stay here forever. And where is this new land? And what will happen when they come with the police? This isn't our place. They're not going to let us stay here. They'll take us all to jail. The voice says, Don't you worry about that. Someone's coming. Eve says, God will send her salvation. A soldier will come. And you will be damned for your doubt. God will not forget that you did not trust her in this hour of triumph. The girl starts crying. The cell phone cameras zoom in. The girl is thrown out of the compound by nightfall. And back in Jacksonville, someone watches the news on the television. Someone sees the face behind the cow, half hidden in shadows. Someone thinks to themselves, I know that face. Margo. Look at this. I am looking at it. Have you read it? Not all of it. This isn't some third world country, Margo. I know that. This is Wisconsin. I can see that. This is happening in goddamn Wisconsin? This? Try to keep calm, Daniel. They should shoot those girls. Just shoot them in the head. Bam! End of story. You can't shoot all the women, Daniel. It's okay, Margot. We wouldn't shoot you. Yeah, that's comforting. Oh, sorry. Your daughter. I forgot. She's, uh... I wouldn't shoot her. Thanks, Daniel. Daniel drums his fingers on the desk. And she thinks as she finds herself thinking quite often, I could kill you for that. It becomes a constant low-level hum in her. A thought she comes back to, like a smooth stone in her pocket to rub her thumb across. There it is, death. It's not okay to talk about shooting young women. Yeah, I know, yeah, I just... He gestures at the screen. 
They're watching a video of six girls demonstrating their power on one another. They stare into the camera. They say, We dedicate this to the goddess. They've learned that from some other video somewhere on the web. They shock one another to the point that one of them faints. Another is bleeding from the nose and ears. This goddess is some kind of internet meme, stoked by the existence of the power, by anonymous forums, and by the imaginations of young people, which are now what they have always been and ever shall be. There is a symbol. It is a hand like the hand of Fatima, the palm containing an eye, the shock tendrils extending from the eye like extra limbs, like the branches of a tree. There are spray-painted versions of this symbol appearing now on walls and railway sidings and motorway bridges, high out-of-the-way places. Some of the internet message boards are encouraging the girls to get together to do terrible things. The FBI is trying to close them down, but as soon as one goes, another springs up to take its place. Margot watches the girls on the screen, playing with their power, screaming as they take a hit, laughing as they deliver one. How's Jas? says Daniel at last. She's fine. She's not fine. She's having trouble with this power. No one knows enough to explain what's happening to her. She can't control the power inside her, and it's getting worse. Margot watches the girls on the screen in Wisconsin. One of them has a tattooed hand of the goddess in the center of her palm. Her friend shrieks as she applies the power, but it's not clear to Margot whether she's crying out with fear, pain, or with delight. And we're joined in the studio today by Mayor Margot Cleary. Some of you might remember Mayor Cleary as a leader who acted swiftly and decisively after the outbreak, probably saving many lives. And she's here with her daughter, Jocelyn. How are you doing, Jocelyn? Joss shifts uneasily in her chair. These seats look comfortable, but they're actually hard. There's something sharp digging into her. The pause goes on a moment too long. I'm fine. Well, now, you have an interesting story, don't you, Jocelyn? You've been having some trouble. Margot puts a hand on Joss's knee. Like a lot of young women, she says, my daughter Jocelyn recently started experiencing the development of the power. We have some footage of that, don't we, Kristen? Here's the press conference on your front lawn. I believe you put a boy in the hospital, didn't you, Jocelyn? They cut to the footage of the day Margot was called home. There's Margot, standing on the steps of the mayor's residence, tucking her hair behind her ears in that way that makes her look nervous even when she's not. In the footage, she puts an arm around Joss and reads from her prepared statement. My daughter was involved in a brief altercation, she says. Our thoughts are with Laurie Vincens and his family. We are grateful that the damage he sustained does not seem to have been serious. This is the kind of accident which is befalling many young women today. Jocelyn and I hope that everyone will remain calm and allow our family to move on from this incident. Wow, that seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it, Kristen? Sure does, Tom. How did it feel, Jocelyn? When you hurt that kid? Joss has been preparing for this with her mom for more than a week now. She knows what to say. Her mouth is dry. She's a trooper. She does it anyway. It was scary, she says. I hadn't learned how to control it. I was worried I could have really hurt him. I wished... I wish someone had shown me how to use it properly. How to control it? There are tears starting in Joss's eyes. They hadn't rehearsed that, but it's great. The producer zooms right in, angling camera three to catch the glisten. It's perfect. She's so young and fresh and beautiful and sad. Sounds really frightening. And you think it would have helped if... Margot steps in again. She's also looking good. Glossy, sleek hair, subtle tones of cream and brown on her eyelids, nothing too showy. She could be that lady on your block who takes care of herself, swims and does yoga. Aspirational. That day started me thinking, Kristen, about how we can really help these girls. The advice right now is just for them not to use their power at all. 
We don't want them just letting off lightning bolts in the street now, do we? Certainly not, Tom. But my three-point plan is this. That's right. Assertive, effective, short sentences, a numbered list, just like on BuzzFeed. One, set up safe spaces for the girls to practice their power together. A trial at first in my metropolitan area, and if it's popular, statewide. Two, identify girls who have good control to help the younger ones learn to keep their power in check. Three, zero tolerance of usage outside these safe spaces. There's a pause. They've talked this through in advance. The audience listening at home will need time to adjust to what they've just heard. So, if I understand what you're proposing, Mayor Cleary, you'd like to use public money to teach girls how to use their power more effectively. More safely, Kristen. And I'm really here to gauge interest. In times like these, we should probably remember what the Bible says. The highest among us aren't always the wisest, and the older generation isn't always the best to judge what's right. She smiles, quoting the Bible, a winning strategy. Anyway, I think it's the job of government to come up with interesting ideas, don't you? Are you suggesting some kind of training camp for these girls? Now, Tom, you know that's not what I'm saying. It's just this. We don't let young people drive a car without getting their license, do we? You wouldn't want the guy rewiring your house to have no training. That's all I'm saying. Let the girls teach the girls. But uh, how do we know what they'll teach them? Tom's sounding a little high-pitched now, a little afraid. This all sounds very dangerous to me. Instead of teaching them how to use it, we should be trying to cure it. That's my bottom line. Kristen smiles directly into the camera. But no one has a cure, do they, Tom? Says in the Wall Street Journal this morning that a multinational group of scientists is certain now that the power is caused by an environmental buildup of nerve agent that was released during the Second World War. It's changed the human genome. All girls born from now on will have the power. All of them. And they'll keep it throughout life, just like the older women do if it's woken up in them. It's too late now to try to cure it. We need new ideas. Tom tries to say something else, but Kristen just carries on. I think it's a great idea, Mayor Cleary. If you want my endorsement, I'm right behind this plan. And now, the weather on the ones. Email from throwawayaddress2945702 at gmail.com. Email to jocelyn.feinbergcleary at gmail.com. Saw you on the news today. You're having trouble with your power. You want to know why? You want to know if anyone else is having trouble too? You don't know the half of it, sister. This rabbit hole goes all the way down. Your gender-bending confusion is just the start of it. We need to put men and women back where they belong. Check out www.urbandocspeaks.com if you want to know the truth. How fucking dare you! There was no movement in your office, Daniel. No one was willing to listen. So you do this? National TV? Promising to roll the thing out statewide? If you remember, Margot, I am the governor of this state, and you are just the mayor of your metropolitan area. You went on national TV to talk about rolling it out statewide? There's no law against it. No law? No fucking law? How about, do you care about any of the agreements we have in place? How about, no one's gonna find you the fucking funding for this thing if you make this number of enemies in one morning's work? How about, I will personally make it my mission to block any proposal you put forward. I have powerful friends in this town, Margo, and if you think you can just railroad over the work we've done so you can become some kind of celebrity... Calm down. I will not fucking calm down! It's not just your tactics, Margot. Not just fucking going to the press. It's the whole cockeyed plan. You're gonna use public money to train basically terrorist operatives to use their weapons more effectively? They are not terrorists. They're girls. You wanna bet? You think there won't be some terrorists in amongst them? You've seen what happened in the Middle East, in India, in Asia. You've seen it on the TV. You want to bet your little scheme won't end up drawing in some fucking jihadis? You done? Am I? Are you done? Because I have work to get on with now, so if you're finished... No, 
I'm not fucking done. But he is. Even as he stands in Margot's office, spitting onto the fine furnishings and the shaved glass awards for municipal excellence, phone calls are being made, emails are being sent, tweets are being posted, and forum posts composed. Did you hear that lady on the morning show today? Where can I sign my girls up for that thing? I mean, seriously, I have three girls, 14, 16, and 19, and they are tearing each other apart. They need some place to go. They gotta let off steam. Before the week is over, Margot's received over one and a half million dollars in donations for her girls' camps. Some checks from worried parents, all the way up to anonymous gifts from Wall Street billionaires. There are people who want to invest in her scheme now. It's going to be a public-private initiative, a model of how government and business can work hand in glove. Before a month is done, she's found spots for the first test centers in the metropolitan area. Old schools shut down when the boys and girls were segregated, places with good-sized gymnasiums and outdoor space. Six other state representatives arrive for informational visits so she can show them what she's planning. And before three months are out, people are beginning to say, you know, why doesn't that Margot Cleary run for something a little more ambitious? Get her in. Let's have a meeting. Tunde. In a dark basement, in a town in rural Moldova, a 13-year-old girl with a faint moustache on her upper lip brings stale bread and old oily fish to a group of women huddled on dirty mattresses. She has been coming here for weeks. She is young and slow-witted. She is the daughter of the man who drives the bread truck. He keeps lookout sometimes for the men who own this house and the women who are kept here. They pay him a little for the stale bread. The women have tried asking the girl for things in the past. A cell phone. Couldn't she bring them a telephone somehow? Some paper to write a note. Could she post something for them? Just one stamp and a paper? When their families hear what's happened to them, they'll be able to pay her, please. The girl has always looked down and shaken her head fiercely, blinking her moist, stupid eyes. The women think the girl may be deaf, or she has been told to be deaf. Things have happened already to these women to make them wish they could be deaf and blind. The bread truck man's daughter empties their bucket of slops into the drain in the yard, rinses it out with a hose, and returns it to them clean, apart from a few flecks of shit under the rim. The smell will be better in here for an hour or two, at least. The girl turns to leave. When she's gone, they'll be in darkness again. Leave us a light, one of the women says. Don't you have a candle? A little light for us? The girl turns towards the door, looks up the stairs to the ground floor. No one is there. She takes the hand of the woman who spoke, turns it palm upward, and in the center of the palm, this thirteen-year-old girl makes a little twist with the thing that has just woken in her collarbone. The woman on the mattress, five and twenty, and thought she was going to a good secretarial job in Berlin, gasps and shudders. Her shoulders squirm and her eyes go wide, and the hand that holds the mattress flickers with a momentary silver light. They wait in the dark. They practice. They have to be certain they can do it all in one go, that no one will have time to reach for his gun. They pass the thing from hand to hand in the dark, and marvel at it. Some of them have been held captive for so long they never heard a word of this thing. For the others, it wasn't more than a strange rumor, a curiosity. They believe God has sent a miracle to save them as he rescued the children of Israel from slavery. From the narrow places, they cried out. In the dark, they were sent light. They weep. One of the overseers comes to unshackle the woman who thought she was going as a secretary to Berlin before she was thrown down on a concrete floor and shown over and over again what her job really was. He has the keys in his hand. They fall on him all at once, and he cannot make a sound, and blood gushes from his eyes and ears. They unlock one another's bonds with his bundle of keys. They kill every man in that house 
and they're still not satisfied. Moldova is the world capital of human sex trafficking. There are a thousand little towns here with staging posts in basements and apartments, in condemned buildings. They trade in men, too, and in children. The girl children grow day by day until the power comes to their hands and they can teach the grown women. This thing happens again and again and again. The change has happened too fast for the men to learn the new tricks they need. It is a gift. Who is to say it does not come from God? Tunde files a series of reports and interviews from the Moldovan border towns where the fighting has been most acute. The women trust him because of his reports from Riyadh. Not many men could have got this close. He's been lucky, but he's also been smart and determined. He brings his other reports with him, shows them to whatever woman says she's in charge of this town or that. They want their stories told. It wasn't just those men who hurt us, a twenty-year-old woman Sonia tells him. We killed them, but it wasn't just them. The police knew what was happening and did nothing. The men in the town beat their wives if they tried to bring us more food. The mayor knew what was happening. The landlords knew what was happening. Postmen knew what was happening. She starts to cry, scrubs at her eyes with the heel of her hand. She shows him the tattoo in the center of her palm, the eye with the tendrils creeping out from it. This means we will never stop watching, she says, like God watches over us. At night, Tunde writes fast and urgently, a diary of sorts, notes from the war. This revolution will need its chronicler. It's going to be him. He has in mind a broad, sweeping book, with interviews, yes, and also assessments of the tide of history, region by region, analysis, nation by nation. Pulling out to see the shockwaves of the power slosh across the planet, zooming in tight to focus on single moments, single stories. Sometimes he writes with such intensity that he forgets that he doesn't have the power himself in his hands and the bones of his neck. It's going to be a big book. Nine hundred pages, a thousand pages, de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Gibbon's Decline and Fall. There'll be an accompanying barrage of footage online, Landsman Shower, reporting from inside the events as well as analysis and argument. He opens his chapter on Moldova with a description of the way the power was passed from hand to hand among the women, then proceeds to the new flowering of online religion and how it shored up support for women taking over towns and then goes on to the inevitable revolution in the government of the country. Tunde interviews the president five days before the government falls. Viktor Moskalev is a small and sweaty man who has held this country together by making a series of alliances and by turning a blind eye to the vast organized crime syndicates that have been using his little unassuming nation as a staging post for their unsavory business. He moves his hands nervously during the interview brushing the few strands of hair left on his head out of his eyes constantly, and dripping sweat across his bald head, even though the room is quite cool. His wife, Tatiana, an ex-gymnast who once almost competed at the Olympics, sits beside him, holding his hand. President Muskalev, says Tunde, deliberately relaxing his voice, smiling. Between you and me. What do you think is happening to your country? Victor's throat muscles clench. They're sitting in the grand receiving room of his palace in Chisinau. Half the furniture is gilded. Tatiana strokes his knee and smiles. She also is gilded. Bronze highlights in her hair glitter on the curve of her cheeks. All countries, says Victor slowly, have had to adapt to the new reality. Tunde leans back, crossing one leg over the other. This isn't going out on the radio or on the internet, Victor. It's just for my book. I'd really like your assessment. Forty-three border towns are now effectively being run by paramilitary gangs, mostly composed of women who freed themselves from sexual slavery. What do you think your chances are of getting control back? Our forces are already moving to quash these rebels, says Victor. Within a few days, this situation will normalize. 
Tunde raises a quizzical eyebrow. Half laughs. Is Victor being serious? The gangs have captured weapons, body armor, and ammunition from the crime syndicates they've destroyed. They're virtually unbeatable. Sorry, what is it that you're planning to do? Bomb your own country to pieces? They're everywhere. Victor smiles an enigmatic smile. If it has to be, that is how it must be. This trouble will pass in just a week or two. Fucking hell. Maybe he really will bomb the whole country and end up sitting as president of a pile of rubble. Or maybe he just hasn't accepted what's really going on here. It'll make an interesting footnote in the book. With his country crumbling around him, President Moskalev seemed almost blasé. In the corridor outside, Tunde waits for an embassy car to take him back to his hotel. Safer to travel under the Nigerian flag here than under Moskalev's protection these days. But it can take two or three hours for the cars to make it through the security. That's where Tatiana Moskalev finds him, waiting on an embroidered chair for someone to call his cell and say that the car's ready. She clicks down the hallway in her spike heels. Her dress is turquoise, skin-tight, ruched, and cut to accentuate those strong gymnast's legs and those elegant gymnast's shoulders. She stands over him. You don't like my husband, do you? She says. I wouldn't say that. He smiles his easy smile. I would. Are you going to print something bad about him? Tunde rests his elbows on the back of the chair, opening his chest. Tatiana, he says, if we're going to have this conversation, is there anything to drink in this palace? There's brandy in a cabinet, in what looks like a 1980s movie idea of a Wall Street boardroom. High shine gold plastic fittings and a dark wood table. She pours them each a generous measure, and they look out over the city together. The presidential palace is a high-rise in the center of town. From the outside, it looks like nothing so much as a mid-price four-star business hotel. Tatiana says, He came to watch a performance at my school. I was a gymnast, performing in front of the Minister for Finance. She drinks. I was seventeen and he was forty-two. But he took me out of that little nothing town. Tunde says, the world's changing. And they exchange a little glance. She smiles. You are going to be very successful. She says, you have the hunger. I've seen it before. And you? Do you have uh, the hunger? She looks him up and down and makes a little laugh through her nose. She can't be more than forty now herself. Look what I can do, she says, although he thinks he already knows what she can do. She puts her palm flat to the frame of the window and closes her eyes. The lights in the ceiling fizz and blink out. She looks up, sighs. Why are they connected to the window frames, says Tunde. Crappy wiring, she says, like everything in this place. Does Victor know you can do it? She shakes her head. Here, Dresser gave it to me. A joke. A woman like you, she said. You'll never need it. You're taken care of. And uh, are you, says Tunde, taken care of? She laughs now properly, full-throatedly. Be careful, she says. Victor would chop your balls off if he heard you talking that way. Tunde laughs too. Is it really Victor I have to be afraid of? Any more? She takes a long, slow swig of her drink. Do you want to know a secret? She says. Always, he says. Awadi Atif, the new king of Saudi Arabia, is in exile in the north of our country. He's been feeding Victor money and arms. That's why Victor thinks he can crush the rebels. Are you serious? She nods. 
Can you get me confirmation of that? Emails, faxes, photographs, anything? She shakes her head. Go and look for him. You're a clever boy. You'll work it out. He licks his lips. Why are you telling me this? I want you to remember me, she says, when you're very successful. Remember that we talked like this now. Just uh, talked, says Tunde. Your car is here, she says, pointing to the long black limousine pulling through the cordon outside the building, thirty floors below them. It's five days after that when Viktor Moskalev dies, quite suddenly and unexpectedly, of a heart attack in his sleep. It is something of a surprise to the world community when, in the immediate aftermath of his death, the Supreme Court of the country unanimously votes in emergency session to appoint his wife Tatiana as interim leader. In the fullness of time, there would be elections in which Tatiana would stand for office, but the most important thing is to maintain order at this difficult time. But, says Tunde in his report, Tatiana Moskalev may have been easy to underestimate. She was a political operator of skill and intelligence and had evidently used her leverage well. In her first public appearance, she wore a small gold brooch in the shape of an eye. Some said this was a nod to the growing popularity of goddess movements online. Some pointed out how very difficult it is to tell the difference between a skillful attack using the electrical power and an ordinary heart attack. But these rumours were without any evidential foundation. Transfers of power, of course, are rarely smooth. This one is complicated by a military coup spearheaded by Victor's chief of defence, who takes more than half the army with him and manages to oust the Moskalev interim government from Chisinau. But the armies of women, freed from chains in those border towns, are broadly and instinctively with Tatiana Moskalev. Upwards of 300,000 women pass through the country every year, sold for the use of their moist bodies and fragile flesh. A great number of those have stayed, having nowhere else to go. On the thirteenth day of the fifth month of the third year after the Day of the Girls, Tatiana Moskalev brings her wealth and her connections, a little less than half her army and many of her weapons, to a castle in the hills on the borders of Moldova. And there, she declares a new kingdom, uniting the coastal lands between the old forests and the great inlets, and thus, in effect, declaring war on four separate countries, including the Big Bear herself. She calls the new country Besapara, after the ancient people who lived there and interpreted the sacred sayings of the priestesses on the mountaintops. The international community waits for the outcome. The consensus is that the state of Besapara cannot hold for long. Tunde records it all in careful notes and documentations. He adds, There is a scent of something in the air. A smell like rainfall after a long drought. First one person, then five, then five hundred, then villages, then cities, then states. Bod to bod and leaf to leaf, something new is happening. The scale of the thing has increased. Roxy There's a girl on the beach at high tide, lighting up the sea with her hands. The girls from the convent watch her from the cliff top. She's waded into the ocean up to her waist, higher. She's not even wearing a bathing suit, just jeans and a black cardigan. And she's setting the sea on fire. It's coming on to dusk, so they can see it clearly. Threads of kelp are spread in a fine disorderly mesh across the surface of the water. And when she sends her power into the water, the particulate and debris glow dimly and the seaweed brighter yet. The light extends in a wide circle around her, lit from beneath, like the great eye of the ocean gazing at the sky. There's a sound like popping candy as the branching limbs of the sargasso plants smolder and the buds swell and burst. 
There's a marine scent, salt and green and pungent. She must be half a mile away, but they can smell it from the cliff top. They think at any moment she must have used out her power, but it goes on. The flickering luminescence in the bay, the scent as the crabs and small fish rise to the surface of the water. The women say to one another, God will send her salvation. She has inscribed the circle on the face of the waters, says Sister Maria Ignatia. She is at the boundary of light and darkness. She is a sign from the mother. They send word to Mother Eve. Someone has come. They'd given Roxy a choice of places to go. Bernie's got family in Israel. She could go to them. Think about it, Rox. Sandy beaches, fresh air. You could go to school with Yuval's kids. He's got two girls about your age, and you've got to believe the Israelis aren't locking girls up for doing what you can do. They've already got them in the army. They're already training them up, Rox. I bet they know stuff you haven't even thought of. She looks it up on the internet, though. They don't even speak English in Israel. All right with English letters. Bernie tries to explain that most people in Israel do speak English, really, but Roxy still says, Nah, don't think so. Then her mum had family near the Black Sea. Bernie points it out on the map. Unless your grandma comes from there. You didn't ever meet your grandma, did you? Your mum's mum? There are still cousins there, still family connections. We do good business with those people, too. You could get in with the business you said you want to. But Roxy had already decided where she wanted to go. I'm not thick, she said. I know you've got to get me out of the country because they're looking for who killed Primrose. It's not a holiday. And Bernie and the boys had stopped talking and just looked at her. You can't say that, Rox, said Ricky. Wherever you go, you just say you're on holiday, all right? I want to go to America, she said. I want to go to South Carolina. Look, there's that woman there, Mother Eve. She does them talks on the internet, you know. Ricky said, So I'll know some people down that way. We can fix you up somewhere to stay, Rox. Someone to look after you. I don't need anyone to look after me. Ricky looked at Bernie. Bernie shrugged. After all she's been through, said Bernie. And that settled it. Ali sits on a rock and dabbles her fingers in the water. Every time the woman in the water discharges her power, she can feel it, even at this distance, like a sharp smack. She says in her heart, What do you think? I've never seen anyone with this much strength in her. The voice says, Didn't I tell you I was sending you a soldier? Ali says in her heart, does she know her destiny? The voice says, Who does, sweet pea? It's dark now, and the lights from the freeway are barely visible here. Ali dips her hand into the ocean and sends out as much charge as she can. She barely sends a flicker across the water. It's enough. The woman in the waves walks towards her. It's too dark to see her face clearly. Ali calls out. You must be cold. I have a blanket here if you want it. The woman in the water says, Bloody hell, what are you, search and rescue? Don't suppose you got a picnic there too, have you? She's British. This is unexpected. Still, the Almighty works in mysterious ways. Roxy, says the woman in the water. I'm Roxy. I'm says Ali, and pauses. For the first time in a long while, she has the urge to tell this woman her real name. Ridiculous. I'm Eve, she says. Oh, my word, says Roxy. Oh, my lord, it's only you I've blimmin' come to find, isn't it? Bloody hell, just got in this morning, night flight, it's a killer, I'm telling you. Had a nap, thought I'd go looking for you tomorrow, and here you bloody are, it's a miracle. See? says the voice. What did I tell you? Roxy hauls herself up onto the flat stone next to Ali. She is suddenly and instantly impressive. She's muscular in her shoulders and arms, but it's more than that. 
Reaching out with that sense that she has honed and practiced, Ali tries to gauge how much power Roxy has in her skein. She feels that she is falling off the edge of the world. It goes on and on, as limitless as the ocean. Oh, she says, a soldier will come. What's that now? Ali shakes her head. Nothing. Something I heard once. Roxy gives her an appraising look. You a bit spooky, then? That's what I thought when I saw your videos. Bit spooky, I thought. You'd do well on one of them TV shows, Most Haunted. You ever seen that? Actually, you don't have anything to eat, do you? I'm starving. Ali pats down her pockets and finds a candy bar in her jacket. Roxy tears into it, taking huge bites. That's better, she says. You know that thing when you've used up a lot of power and it just makes you starving hungry? She pauses, looks at Ali. No. Why were you doing it? The light in the water? Roxy shrugs. It's just an idea I had. Never been in the sea before, wanted to see what I could do. She squints out at the ocean. Think I'll kill a bloody load of fish. You could probably have dinner out of them all this week if you've got... She juggles her hands. I don't know, a boat and a net or something. I suppose some of them might be poison. Do you get poison fish? Or is it just like jewels and that? Ali laughs in spite of herself. It's been a while since someone last made her laugh. Since she last laughed without deciding beforehand that laughing was the smart thing to do. She just had an idea, says the voice. It just popped into her head. She came looking for you. I told you a soldier would come. Yeah, says Ali. Shut up for a minute, okay? What made you come to look for me, says Ali. Roxy shifts her shoulders as if she's darting and weaving, escaping imaginary blows. I had to get out of England for a bit, and I saw you on YouTube. She takes a breath, lets it all out, smiles at herself and then says, Look, I don't know, all those things you talk about where you say that God's made this all happen for a reason and women are supposed to take over from men. I don't believe in any of that God stuff, all right? All right. But I think, like, do you know what they're teaching girls in school in England? Breathing exercises. No kidding, bleeding, breathing. Bleeding, keep it under control. Don't use it, don't do anything. Keep yourself nice and keep your arms crossed. You know what I mean? And like, I had sex with a bloke a few weeks back and he was practically begging me to do it to him. Just a little bit. He'd seen it on the internet. No one's going to keep their arms crossed forever. My dad's all right and my brothers are all right. They're not bad, but I wanted to talk to you because you're like, you're thinking about what it means for the future, you know? It's exciting. It comes out of her in a big rush. What do you think it means? Says Ali. Everything's gonna change, says Roxy, picking at the seaweed with one hand while she talks. Stands to reason, doesn't it? We've all got to find some new way to work together on it. You know? Blokes have got a thing they can do, they're strong, women have got a thing now too. And there's still guns, they don't stop working, lots of blokes with guns. I'm no match for them. I feel like... It's exciting, you know? I was saying this to my dad, the stuff we could do together. Ali laughs. Do you think they'll want to work with us? Well, some of them yeah, and some of them no, right? But the sensible ones will. I was talking about it with my dad. Do you ever get that feeling when you're in a room and you can tell which girls around you got loads of power and which have got none? You know, like, like spider sense. This is the first time Ali has ever heard anyone else talk about this sense. She has particularly acutely. Yes, she says. I think I know what you mean. Bloody hell, no one knows what I mean. Not that I've talked about it with loads of people. Anyway, that... Useful to be able to tell the blokes, right? Useful to work together. Ali flattens her lips. I see it a bit differently, you know? Yeah, mate, I know you do. I've seen your stuff. I think there's going to be a great battle between light and darkness, and your destiny is to fight on our side. I think you will be mightiest in the mightiest. 
Roxy laughs and chucks a pebble into the sea. I always fancied having a destiny, she says. Look, can we go somewhere? Yours or somewhere? It's bloody freezing out here. They let her come to Terry's funeral. It was a bit like Christmas. There was aunties and uncles and booze and bridge rolls and hard-boiled eggs. There was people putting an arm round her and telling her she's a good girl. And Ricky gave her some stuff before they set off, and he took some himself and went, just to take the edge off. So it felt like snow was falling, like it was cold and high up. Just like Christmas. At the grounds, Barbara, Terry's mum, went to throw a trail of dirt onto the coffin. When the earth hit the wood, she made a long, wailing cry. There was a car parked and blokes with long-length cameras taking pictures. Ricky and some of his mates scared them off. When they came back, Bernie said, Perhaps. And Ricky said, Could be police, working with. Roxy's in a bit of trouble over this, probably. They were all right to her at the reception, but at the grounds, none of the mourners knew where to put their faces when she walked past. At the convent, supper is already being served when Ali and Roxy arrive. There's a place saved for them at the head of the table, and there's chatter, and the smell of good warm food. It's a stew with clams and mussels and potatoes and corn. There's crusty bread and apples. Roxy has a feeling she can't quite name, can't really place. It makes her a little bit soft inside, a bit teary. One of the girls finds her a change of clothes, a warm knitted jumper and a pair of sweatpants all warm and cosy from being washed so often, and that's just how she feels, too. The girls all want to chat to her. They've never heard an accent like hers, and they make her say, water and banana. There's so much talking. Roxy always thought she was a bit of a blabbermouth, but this is something else. After supper, Mother Eve gives a little lesson in the scripture. They're finding scripture that works for them, rewriting the bits that don't. Mother Eve speaks on the story of the Book of Ruth. She reads out the passage where Ruth tells her mother-in-law, her friend, Don't tell me to leave you. Whither thou goest, I shall go. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Mother Eve is easy amongst these women, in a way Roxy finds difficult. She's not used to the company of girls. It's been boys in Bernie's family, and boys in Bernie's gang, and her mum was always more of a man's woman, and the girls at school never treated Roxy nice. Mother Eve's not awkward like Roxy here. She holds the hands of two of the girls sitting next to her and speaks softly and with humour. She says, That story about Ruth, that's the most beautiful story of friendship in the whole of the Bible. No one was ever more faithful than Ruth. No one ever expressed the bonds of friendship better. There are tears in her eyes as she speaks, and the girls around the table are already moved. It's not for us to worry about the men, she says. Let them please themselves, as they always have. If they want to war with each other and to wander, let them go. We have each other. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, my sisters. And they say, Amen. Upstairs, they've made a bed up for Roxy. It's just a little room. A single bed with a hand-stitched quilt across it, a table and chair, a view of the ocean. She wants to weep when they open the door, but she doesn't show it. She remembers quite suddenly as she sits on the bed and feels the coverlet under her hand. A night when her dad brought her back to his house, the house he lived in with Barbara and with Roxy's brothers. It was late at night, and her mum was ill with vomiting, and she'd called Bernie to pick up Roxy and he'd come. She was in her pyjamas. She can't have been more than five or six. She remembers Barbara saying, Well, she can't stay here. And Bernie going, For fuck's sake, just put her in the guest room. And Barbara crossing her arms across her bosom and going, I told you, she's not staying here. Send her to your brothers if you have to. It was raining that night, and her dad carried her back out to the car. 
the drops falling past the hood of her dressing gown to fall on her chest. There's someone expecting Roxy this evening, sort of. Someone will catch her in the neck if they've lost her anyway. But she's sixteen, and one text will sort that out. Mother Eve closes the door, so it's just the two of them in the little room. She sits on the chair and says, You can stay as long as you like. Why? I've got a good feeling about you. Roxy laughs. Would you have a good feeling about me if I was a boy? But you're not a boy. Do you have a good feeling about all women? Mother Eve shakes her head. Not this good. Do you want to stay? Yeah, says Roxy. For a bit anyway. See what you're up to here? I like your, um... She searches for the word. I like how it feels here. Mother Eve says, You're strong, aren't you? Strong as anyone. Stronger than anyone, mate. Is that why you like me? We can use someone strong. Yeah. You got big plans. Mother Eve leans forward, puts her hands on her knees. I want to save the women. She says, What, all of them? Roxy laughs. Yes, says Mother Eve, if I can. I want to reach them and tell them that there are new ways to live now, that we can band together, that we can let men go their own way, that we don't need to stick to the old order. We can make a new path. Oh, yeah. You do need a few blokes to make babies, you know. Mother Eve smiles. All things are possible with God's help. Ali's phone beeps. She looks at it, makes a face, turns it over so she can't see the screen. Or sup, says Roxy. People keep emailing the convent. Trying to get you out of here? Nice place. I can see why they'd want it back. Trying to give us money. Roxy laughs. What's the problem? Got too much? Ali looks at Roxy thoughtfully for a moment. Only Sister Maria Ignatia has a bank account, and I... She runs her tongue over her top front teeth, makes her lips click. Roxy says, You don't trust no one, do you? Ali smiles. Do you? Price of doing business, mate. Gotta trust someone or you'll get nothing done. You need a bank account? How many do you want? Want some out of the country? Cayman Islands is good, I think. Don't know why. Wait, what do you mean? But before Ali can stop her, Roxy's taken out her phone, snapped a picture of Ali and is sending a text. Roxy grins. Trust me. Gotta find some way to pay my rent, don't I? A man arrives at the convent before seven o'clock the next morning. He drives up to the front gate and just waits there. Roxy knocks on Ali's door, drags her down the driveway in her dressing gown. What? What is it? says Ali. But she's smiling. Come and see. All right, Einar, says Roxy to the man. He's stocky, mid-forties, dark hair, wearing a pair of sunglasses on his forehead. Einar grins and nods slowly. You okay here, Roxanne? Bernie Monk said to look after you. Are you being looked after? On grand, Einar, says Roxy. Super duper. Just gonna stay with me mates here for a few weeks, I reckon. You got what I need? Ina laughs at her. I met you in London once, Roxanne. You were six years old, and you kicked me in the shins when I wouldn't buy you a milkshake while we waited for your dad. Roxy laughs too, easily. This is simpler for her than the dinner. Ali can see it. Should have bought me a milkshake then, shouldn't you? Come on, hand it over. There's a bag with... Clearly, some of Roxy's clothes and other things in. There's a laptop, brand new, top of the range, and there's a little zip-up case. Roxy balances it on the edge of the open car boot and unzips it. Careful, says Ina. Rush job. Ink will still smudge if you rub it. Got that, Evie? says Roxy. Now rubbing them till they're dry. Roxy hands her a few items from inside the case. Their passports. U.S. ones, driver's licenses, social security cards, 
all as legitimate looking as if they'd been made up by the government themselves. And all the licenses and all the passports have her photo in. Changed a bit each time. Different hair, a couple of them with glasses. And different names, to match the names on the social security cards and the licenses. But her, every time. We did you seven, says Roxy. Half a dozen and one for luck. Seventh one's UK, in case you fancy it. Do you manage to get the bank accounts, Einar? All set up, says Einar, fishing another smaller zip-up wallet out of his pocket. But no deposits over 100,000 in one day, without talking to us first, all right? Dollars or pounds, says Roxy. Einar winces slightly. Dollars, he says. Then hurriedly, but only for the first six weeks. Then they take the checks off the accounts. Fine, says Roxy. I won't kick you in the shins, this time. Roxy and Daryl kicked around in the garden for a bit, towing at stones and picking bark off the tree. Neither of them ever even liked Terry that much. But it's weird now he's gone. Daryl went, What did it feel like? And Roxy was like, I wasn't down there when they got Terry. And Daryl went, Nah, I mean when you did Primrose. What did it feel like? She felt it again. The glitter under her palm. The way his face grew warm and then cold. She sniffed. Looked at her own hand as if it could tell her the answer. It felt good, she said. He killed my mum, Daryl said. I wish I could do it. Roxanne Monk and Mother Eve talk a lot in the next few days. They find the things they have in common and hold them out at arm's length to admire the details. The missing mother. The place they're both used to holding, half in and half out of families. I like how you all say sister here. I never had a sister. I didn't either, says Ali. Always wanted one, says Roxy. And they leave that there for a bit. Some of the girls in the convent want to spar with Roxy, practice their skills. She's up for it. They use the big lawn at the back of the building, leading down to the ocean. She takes them two or three at once, sidesteps them, hits them hard, confuses them till they jolt each other. They come in for supper bruised and laughing, sometimes with a tiny spiderweb scar on the wrist or ankle. They wear it proudly. There are girls as young as eleven or twelve here. They follow Roxy about like she's a pop star. She tells them to get off, go and find something else to do. But she likes it. She teaches them a special fighting trick she's worked out. Splosh a bottle of water in someone's face. Stick your finger in the water as it spurts out of the bottle. Electrify the whole thing. They practice it on each other on the lawn, giggling and hurling water about. Roxy sits with Allie on the porch late one afternoon, when the sun's setting red gold behind them. They're watching the kids, larking about on the lawn. Allie says, Reminds me of me, when I was ten. Oh yeah, big family. There's a longish pause. Roxy wonders if she's asked something she shouldn't have asked. But fuck it, she can wait. Allie says, Children's home. Right, says Roxy. I know kids who come from that. It's rough. Hard to get on your feet. You're doing all right now, though. I look after myself, says Ali. I learned how to take care of myself. Yeah, I can see that. The voice in Ali's head has been quiet these past few days. Quieter than she remembers it being in years. Something about being here, these summer days, knowing that Roxy's here and she could kill anyone stone dead. Something about that has made it all go quiet. Ali says, I was passed around a lot when I was a child. Never knew my dad, and my mom's just a little scrap of memory. Just a hat is what Ali remembers. A pale pink Sunday church hat at a daring angle 
and a face underneath grinning at her, sticking her tongue out. It seems like a happy memory, from some time between long bouts of sadness or illness or both. She doesn't remember ever going to church, but there's that hat in her memory. Ali says, I think I've had twelve homes before this one, maybe thirteen. She passes a hand across her face, digs her fingertips into her forehead. They put me in a place once with a lady who collected China dolls. Hundreds, everywhere, staring at me from the walls in the room I slept in. She dressed me up nice, I remember that. Little pastel dresses with ribbons threaded through the hems. But she went to jail for stealing. That's how she paid for all those dolls. So I was sent on. One of the girls on the lawn pours water on another, setting it sparkling with a faint jolt. The other girl giggles. It tickles. People make what they need for themselves, says Roxy. My dad says that. If there's something you need, something you really have to have, not just want to, but have to, you'll find a way to get it. She laughs. He was talking about junkies, wasn't he? But it's more than that. Roxy looks at the girls on the lawn, at this house which is a home, more than a home. Ali smiles. If you make it, you've got to protect it. Yeah, well, I'm here now. You have more power than anyone we've ever seen, you know. Roxy looks at her hands like she's a bit impressed, a bit afraid. I don't know, she says. It's probably other people like me. Allie has a sudden intuition then, like a fairground machine with gears working and chains clanking. Someone had taken her to one when she was a little girl, put in two quarters, pulled the lever, clunk, grind, thunk. There's a fortune printed on a small rectangle of thick, pink-edged cardboard. Allie's intuition is just like that, sudden and complete, as if there were machinery working behind her eyes that even she has no access to. Clank, thunk. The voice says, Here, this is something you know now. Use it. Ali speaks quite softly. Did you kill someone? Roxy sticks her hands in her pockets and frowns. Who told you? And because she does not say, who told you that? Ali knows that she is right. The voice says, say nothing. Ali says, sometimes I just know things, like there's a voice in my head. Roxy says, Bloody hell, you are spooky. Who's going to win the Grand National then? Ali says, I killed someone too. Long way away now. I was a different person. Probably deserved it if he did it. He did. They sit with that. Roxy says, companionably, and as if it has nothing to do with anything, there was a bloke who stuck his hand down my pants when I was seven. Piano teacher. My mum thought it'd be nice for me to learn piano. There I was on the stool doing Every Good Boy Deserves Fun, and suddenly handing my knickers. Don't say anything, he goes. Just carry on playing. So I told my dad the next night when he came to take me out to the park. And bloody hell, he went mental. Screaming at my mum, how could she? She told him she didn't know, did she, or she wouldn't have let him. My dad took some of the boys round to that piano teacher's house. Ali says, What happened? Roxy laughs. They beat the shit out of him. He ended the night with one less nut than he started it, for one thing. Really? Yeah, of course. My dad said if he had one more pupil round that house, and he meant ever, he'd come back for the other veg and the meat too. And not to think about leaving town and starting up again somewhere else because Bernie Monk is bloody everywhere. Roxy chuckles to herself. Yeah, I saw him in the street once, and he ran away.
saw me, right? Turned and actually ran. Bloody right, mate. Ali says, That's good. That sounds good. She makes a little sigh. Roxy says, Oh no, you don't trust them. It's all right. You don't have to trust them, babe. She reaches over and puts her hand on top of Ali's, and they sit there like that for a long time. After a while, Ali says, one of the girls has a dad in the police force. He telephoned her two days ago to tell her she can't be in this building on Friday. Roxy laughs. Dads, they like keeping their daughters safe. They can't keep secrets. Will you help us? Says Ali. What do you think is coming? Says Roxy. SWAT team? Not so much. We're only a few girls in a convent. Practicing our religion like law-abiding citizens. I can't kill anyone else, says Roxy. I don't think we'll have to, says Ali. I've got an idea. They mopped up the rest of Primrose's gang after he died. Wasn't any bother. They all fell apart after he was gone. Two weeks after Terry's funeral, Bernie called Roxy on her mobile at 5am and told her to come to a lock-up garage in Dagenham. There, he fished the big bunch of keys out of his pocket, opened it up, and showed her two bodies laid out, killed cold and clean, and about to go into the acid, and that'd be the end of that. She looked them in the face. That them, said Bernie. Yeah, she said. She snaked her arm around her dad's waist. Thanks. Anything for my guilt, he said. Big bloke, little bloke. The two who killed her mum. One of them with her mark still on his arm, livid and branching. All done then, sweetheart, he said. All done, Dad. He kissed her on the top of the head. They went for a walk that morning round Eastbrook End Cemetery. Slow walking, chatting, while a couple of cleaners did the necessary in the garage. You know the day you was born was the day we got Jack Conahan, said Bernie. Roxy does know this. Still, she likes to hear the story again. He'd been on us for years, said Bernie. Killed Mickey's dad. You never knew him. Him and the Irish boys. We got him in the end, though. Fishing in the canal. We waited all night for him. And when he got there early, we did him. Chucked him in. That was that. When we was done and home and dry, I checked my phone. Fifteen messages from your mum. Fifteen! She got into labour overnight, hadn't she? Roxy felt her fingertips around the edges of this story. It always seemed slippery. Something fighting its way out of her grasp. She was born in the darkness and with people waiting for someone. Her dad waiting for Jack Conahan. Her mum waiting for her dad. And Jack Conahan though he never knew it, waiting for death. It's a story about the stuff that happens just exactly when you weren't expecting it. Just on that night you thought nothing was going to happen, everything happens. I picked you up. A girl. After three boys. Never thought I'd have a girl. And you looked me dead in the eye and whittled all down my trousers. And that's how I knew you'd be good luck. She is good luck. Barring a few things, she's always had good luck. How many miracles does it take? Not too many. One, two, three is plenty. Four is a great multitude, more than enough. There are twelve armed police officers advancing across the gardens at the back of the convent. It's been raining. The ground is waterlogged, and more than waterlogged. There are open taps running at both sides of the garden. The girls have run a pump to bring seawater up to the top of the steps, and it's a waterfall now, water gushing down the stone stairs. The officers aren't wearing rubber boots. They didn't know it'd be muddy like this. All they know is that a lady from the convent had come to tell them that girls were holed up in here and had been threatening and violent. So there are twelve trained men in body armour coming for them. It should be enough to finish this. 
The men shout out. Police, leave the building now, with your hands in the air. Ali looks at Roxy. Roxy grins at her. They're waiting behind the curtains in the dining room, the one that looks out over the back gardens, waiting until the police are all on the stone stairs leading to the terrace outside the back doors. Waiting, waiting. And there they all are. Roxy pulls the corks out from the half-dozen barrels of seawater they've stored behind them. The carpet is sodden now, and the water's gushing out under the door towards the steps. They're all in one mass of water, Roxy and Allie, and the police. Allie puts her hand into the water around her ankles, and concentrates. Outside on the terrace, and on the stairs, water is touching the skin of all the police officers, one way or another. It needs more control than Allie's ever managed before. Their fingers are on the triggers. They want to squeeze. But one by one she sends her message through the water, as fast as thought, and one by one the officers jerk like puppets. The angles of their elbows fly out. Their hands unclench and go numb. One by one, they drop their guns. Fucking hell, says Roxy. Now, says Allie and climbs up onto a chair. Roxy, the woman with more power than she knows what to do with, sends a bolt through the water, and each of the police officers starts and bucks and topples to the ground, neat as you like. It had to be only one woman doing it. A dozen convent girls couldn't have acted together so quickly without hurting each other. A soldier had to come. Roxy smiles. Upstairs, Gordy's been filming it on her cell phone. It'll be online in an hour. You don't need too many miracles before people start believing in you, and then sending you money, and offers of legal help to get yourself properly set up. Everyone's looking for some kind of answer. Today, more than ever. Mother Eve records a message to go out over the footage. She says, I have not come to tell you to give up a single strand of your belief. I am not here to convert you, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist. If you are of any faith or none at all, God does not want you to change your practice. She pauses. She knows this is not what they're expecting to hear. God loves all of us, she says, and she wants us to know that she has changed her garment merely. She is beyond female and male. She is beyond human understanding. But she calls your attention to that which you have forgotten. Jews, look to Miriam, not Moses, for what you can learn from her. Muslims, look to Fatima, not Muhammad. Buddhists, remember Tara, the mother of liberation. Christians, pray to Mary for your salvation. You have been taught that you are unclean, that you are not holy, that your body is impure and could never harbor the divine. You have been taught to despise everything you are and to long only to be a man. But you have been taught lies. God lies within you. God has returned to earth to teach you in the form of this new power. Do not come to me looking for answers, for you must find the answers within yourself. What can ever be more seductive than to be asked to stay away? What draws people nearer than being told they are unwelcome? Already that evening there are emails. Where can I go to join with your followers? What can I do here at home? How do I set up a prayer circle for this new thing? Teach us how to pray. And there are the appeals for help. My daughter is sick. Pray for her. My mother's new husband has handcuffed her to the bed. Please send someone to rescue her. Allie and Roxy read the emails together. Allie says, We have to try to help. Roxy says, you can't help them all, babe. Allie says, I can. With God's help, I can. Roxy says, maybe you don't need to go and get all of them to help all of them.
The police force, all across the state, gets worse after the video of what Ali and Roxy did goes up online. They felt humiliated. Of course they did. They had something to prove. There are states and countries where the police are already actively recruiting women, but that hasn't happened here yet. The force is still mostly male, and they're angry, and they're afraid, and then things happen. Twenty-three days after the police tried to take the convent, a girl arrives at the door with a message for Mother Eve. Only Mother Eve. Please, they have to help her. She's weak with crying and shaking and frightened. Roxy makes her a hot sweet tea, and Ali finds her some cookies, and the girl, her name's Mez, tells them what's happened. It was seven armed police officers patrolling their neighborhood. Mez and her mom were walking home from the grocery store, just talking. Mez is twelve and has had the power for a few months. Her mom's had it for longer. Her little cousin woke it up in her. They were just talking, says Mez, just holding their grocery bags and chatting and laughing, and then suddenly there were six or seven cops saying, What's in the bags? Where are you going? We've had reports of a couple of women causing trouble round here. What have you got in those damn bags? Mez's mom didn't take it too seriously. She just laughed and said, What are we gonna have in here? Groceries from the grocery store. And one of the cops said she was acting pretty cool for a woman walking in a dangerous area. What had she been doing? And Mez's mom just said, Leave us alone. And they pushed her. And she hit two of them, just with a little tickle of power. Just a warning. And that was it for the cops. They pulled out their nightsticks and their guns and they started working. And Mez was screaming, and her mom was screaming, and there was blood all on the sidewalk, and they mashed her on her head. They held her down, says Mez, and they messed her up. It was seven on one. Ali listens to it all very actively, and when Mez has finished talking, she says, Is she alive? Mez nods. Do you know where they have taken her? Which hospital? Mez says, they didn't take her to a hospital. They've taken her to the police station. Ali says to Roxy, we're going down there. Roxy says, then we have to take everyone. There are 60 women who walk down the street together towards the police station where they're holding Mez's mom. They walk quietly but quickly, and they're filming everything. That's the word they've passed around the women in the convent. Document everything. Stream it if you can. Put it online. By the time they arrive, the police know they're coming. There are men standing outside holding rifles. Ali walks up to them. She holds her hands up, palms towards them. She says, We've come here peacefully. We want to see Rachel Latif. We want to know she's receiving medical attention. We want her sent to a hospital. The senior officer standing at the door says, Mrs. Latif is being legally detained. By what power do you ask for her release? Ali looks to the left and to the right, along the phalanx of women she's brought with her. There are more women arriving every minute. There are maybe 250 here now. The news of what's happened has passed from door to door. There have been text messages. Women have seen it online and left their houses and come. The only power that matters, she says, the common laws of humanity and God. There is a badly injured woman in your cells. She needs to see a doctor. Roxy can feel the power crackling in the air around her. The women here are hyped up, excited, angry. She wonders if the men can feel it too. The policemen with their rifles are nervous. Something could go bad here, very easily. The senior police officer shakes his head and says, We can't let you in, and your presence here is a threat to my officers. Ali says, We're here peacefully. Officer, we are peaceful. We want to see Rachel Latif. We want a doctor to treat her. A great muttering rises up in the crowd, then falls silent, waiting. The senior officer says, If I let you see her, 
Will you tell these women to go home? Ali says, let me see her first. Rachel Latif, when Roxy and Ali are brought to the holding cell to see her, is barely conscious. Her hair is matted with blood, and she is lying on the cot in the cell, hardly moving, her breath a slow, painful rattle. Roxy says, Jesus Christ. Ali says, Officer, this woman must be taken to a hospital immediately. The other policemen are watching the senior officer. More and more women are arriving outside the building every minute. The sound of them outside is like a crowd of murmuring birds, each one speaking to her neighbor, each ready to wheel at a secret signal. There are only twenty officers in this station. There'll be several hundred women outside within one half hour. Rachel Latif's skull is cracked open. You can see the white bone shattered and the blood bubbling from her brain. The voice says, They did it without provocation. You've been provoked. You could take this station. You could kill every man in it if you wanted. Roxy takes Ali's hand, squeezes it. Roxy says, Officer, you don't want this to go any further. You don't want this to be the story they tell about you. Let this woman go to a hospital. The police officer lets out a long, slow sigh. The crowd outside grows noisy when Ali re-emerges, and even noisier when they hear the approaching sirens of the ambulance nosing its way through the crowd. Two women hoist Mother Eve onto their shoulders. She holds up her hand. The muttering grows silent. Mother Eve speaks through Ali's mouth and says, I am taking Rachel Latif to the hospital. I will ensure she is cared for properly. The noise again, like grass stalks blowing. It rises up and dies away. Mother Eve splays her fingers out, like the sign of the hand of Fatima. She says, You have done good work here, and now you can go home. The women nod. The girls from the convent turn and walk away as one. The other women begin to follow them. Half an hour later, when Rachel Latif is being examined in the hospital, the street outside the police station is entirely empty. In the end, there's no need for them to stay in the convent. It's nice, it overlooks the sea, and it's got a certain homely feel to it. But by the time Roxy's been there nine months, Ali's organization could have bought a hundred buildings like it. And anyway, they need somewhere bigger. There are six hundred women affiliated with the convent in this little town alone, and satellites springing up across the country, around the world. The more the authorities say she's illegitimate, the more the old church says she's sent by the devil, the more women are drawn to Mother Eve. If Ali had any doubt before this that she has been sent by God with a message for her people, the things that have happened here have left her in no doubt. She is here to look after the women. God has appointed her to that role, and it is not for Ali to deny it. It's spring come round again when they're talking about new buildings. Roxy says, You'll save a room for me, won't you, wherever you end up? Ali says, don't go. Why would you go? Why back to England? What's there for you? Roxy says, my dad reckons it's all blown over. No one cares what we do to each other, really, as long as we don't get any honest citizens involved. She grins. But really, Ali flattens her lips. Really, why would you go home? This is your home. Stay here. Please, stay with us. Roxy squeezes Ali's hand. Mate, she says, I miss my family. I miss my dad. And like, Marmite, I miss all that stuff. I'm not going away forever. We'll see each other again. Ali breathes in through her nose. There is a murmuring at the back of her mind that has been quiet and far away for months now. She shakes her head. She says, You can't trust them, though. 
Roxy laughs. What men? All men? Can't trust any of them? Ali says. Be careful. Find women you trust to work with you. Roxy says. Yeah, we've talked about this, babe. You have to take it all, says Ali. You can. You've got it. Don't let Ricky take it. Don't let Daryl take it. It's yours. Roxy says, You know, I think you're right. But I can't take it all sitting here, can I? She swallows. I've booked a ticket. I'll leave a week on Saturday. There's stuff I wanted to talk about with you before that. Plans. Can we talk about plans? Without you going on about how I should just stay? We can. Ali says in her heart, I don't want her to go. Can we stop that happening? The voice says to Ali, Remember, sweetheart, the only way you're safe is if you own the place. Ali says, Can I own the whole world? The voice says, very quietly, just as it used to speak many years ago. Oh, honey. Oh, baby girl. You can't get there from here. Roxy says, The thing is, I've got an idea. Ali says, So do I. They look at each other and smile. Audio Guide for the Museum of Post-Cataclysm Artifacts This case contains a damaged square wooden frame with a metal handle and components. Its use is debated. The display text reads, Approximately 1500 years old, a device for training in the use of the electrostatic power. The handle at the base is iron and is connected, within the wooden frame, to a metal peg marked A on the diagram. We conjecture that a piece of paper or dry leaf could be affixed to the spike, marked B on the diagram, with the aim being for the operator to set it aflame. This would require a degree of control, presumably the skill being practiced. The size suggests that the device was meant for 13 to 15 year old girls. Discovered in Thailand. Archival documents relating to the electrostatic power, its origin, dispersal, and the possibility of a cure. 1. Description of the short Second World War propaganda film, Protection Against Gas. The film itself has been lost. The film is 2 minutes and 52 seconds long. At the start, a brass band strikes up. The percussion joins in with the brass, and the tune is jaunty as the title comes up on the screen. The title is Protection Against Gas. The card is hand-inked, wavering slightly as the camera focuses on it before a sharp cut to a group of men in white coats, standing in front of a huge vat of liquid. They wave and smile at the camera. At the Ministry of War Laboratories, says the clipped male voiceover, the backroom boys work double shifts on their latest brainwave. The men dip a ladle into the liquid and, using a pipette, drop some of it onto testing papers. They smile. They add a single droplet to the water bottle of a white rat in a cage, with a large black inked X on its back. The brass band ups the tempo as the rat drinks the water. Staying one step ahead of the enemy is the only way to keep the population safe. This rat has been given a dose of the new nerve strengthener developed to combat gas attack. Cut away to another rat in a cage. No X on the back. This rat has not. A canister of white gas is opened in the small room containing the two cages, and the scientists, wearing breathing apparatus, retreat behind a glass wall. The untreated rat succumbs quickly, waving its forepaws in the air distressingly before it begins to twitch. We do not follow its final throes. The rat with the X on its back continues to suck at the bottle, nibble at food pellets, and even run in its exercise wheel as the smoke drifts past the cameras. As you can see, says the brisk voiceover, it works. 
One of the scientists takes off his gas mask and walks decisively into the smoke-filled room. He waves from inside and takes deep lungfuls. And it's safe for humans. The scene changes to a waterworks, where a pipe is being hooked up from a small tanker lorry into an outlet valve in the floor. They call it Guardian Angel, the medical cure that has kept Allied forces safe from enemy attack by gas is now being given to the general population. Two balding middle-aged men, one with a toothbrush moustache and wearing a dark suit, shake hands as a meter shows the liquid from the lorry slowly going down. Just a tiny amount in the drinking water will be enough to protect an entire town. This single tank is sufficient to treat the drinking water for 500,000 people. Coventry, Hull and Cardiff will be the first to receive the water treatment. Working at this pace, the entire country will be covered within three months. A mother on the street of a northern town lifts her baby out of the pram, rests it on a cloth on her shoulder, and looks up, concerned to the clear sky. So mother can feel secure that her baby need no longer fear nerve gas attack. Rest easy, mother and child. The music reaches a crescendo. The screen darkens. The reel ends. 2. Notes distributed to journalists to accompany the BBC programme, The Source of Power. The story of Guardian Angel was forgotten shortly after the Second World War. As with so many ideas which worked flawlessly, there was no reason to re-examine it. At the time, however, Guardian Angel was a tremendous success and a propaganda victory. Tests on the general population in Britain proved that the substance accumulated in the system. Even a week spent drinking Guardian Angel-laced water would provide never-ending protection against nerve gas. Guardian Angel was manufactured in great vats in the heartland of the USA and in the home counties of the UK. It was transported by tanker to friendly nations, to Hawaii and to Mexico, to Norway, to South Africa and to Ethiopia. The enemy's U-boats harried the vessels, as they did every shipment coming to or from the Allies. Inevitably, one dark night in September 1944, a tanker was sunk with all hands 16 miles off the coast of Portugal, on its way to the Cape of Good Hope. Subsequent research has found that over the following months, in the coastal towns of Aveiro, Espinho and Porto, strange things washed ashore. Fish much larger than any they'd seen before. Shoals of these unusually sized creatures had apparently hurled themselves at the beaches. The people in the villages and towns along the coast ate the fish. An analysis by a conscientious Portuguese official in 1947 revealed that Guardian Angel was detectable in the groundwater as far inland as Estrela, near the Spanish border. But his suggestion that the water table should be tested across Europe was rejected. There were no resources available for the task. Some analysis suggests that the sinking of this one ship was the critical moment. Others maintain that, once the liquid had entered the water cycle at any point, in any reservoir, in any place in the world, it would inevitably spread. Other potential sources of contamination include a spill from a rusted container in Buenos Aires several years after the war, and an explosion at a munitions dump in southern China. Nonetheless, the oceans of the world are connected to one another. The water cycle is endless. Although Guardian Angel had been forgotten after the Second World War, it continued to concentrate and magnify its potency in the human body. Research has now established it as the undoubted trigger, once certain concentrations had been reached for the development of the electrostatic power in women. Any woman who was seven years old or younger during the Second World War may have skein buds on the points of her collarbones. Although not all do, it will depend on what dose of guardian angel was received in early childhood, and on other genetic factors. These buds can be activated by a controlled burst of electrostatic power by a younger woman. They are present in increasingly large proportions of women with every birth year that passes. Women who were about 13 or 14 years old around the day of the girls almost invariably possess a full skein. 
Once the skein power has been activated, it cannot be taken away without tremendous danger to the woman's life. It is theorized that Guardian Angel merely amplified a set of genetic possibilities already present in the human genome. It is possible that, in the past, more women possessed a skein, but that this tendency was bred out over time. 3. SMS Conversation between the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister, classified and released under the 30-year rule. PM. Just read the report, Home Secretary. Thoughts? We can't release it, Prime Minister. The US are set to release in a month. Fuck's sake. Ask them to delay. They're adopting a policy of radical openness. They're evangelical about it. As usual. You can't stop Americans being American. They're 5,000 miles from the Black Sea. I'll talk to the Secretary of State. We need to tell them it's a NATO matter. Releasing the report will harm the stability of fragile regimes. Regimes that could easily get their hands on chemical and biological weapons. It's going to leak, anyway. We need to think about how this impacts on us. There's going to be pandemonium. Because there's no cure. No fucking cure. It's not a fucking crisis anymore. This is the new reality. 4. Online Advertisement Collection, preserved by the Internet Archive Project. 4A. Keep safe with your personal defender. The personal defender is safe, reliable, and easy to use. The battery pack worn on your belt connects to a wrist-mounted taser. This product is approved by police officers and has been independently tested. It is discreet. No one needs to know you can defend yourself but you. It is ready at hand. No need to fumble in a holster or pocket if under attack. You will not find any other product as reliable and effective. Complete with an additional phone charging socket. Note, the personal defender was subsequently withdrawn, following incidents fatal to the users. It was established that a woman's body, receiving a large electric shock, would often produce a large reflexive arc bouncing back towards her attacker even if she fell unconscious. The manufacturers of the personal defender settled a class action suit out of court with the families of 17 men who were killed in this way. 4B. Increase your power with this one weird trick. Women all over the world are learning how to increase the duration and strength of their power using this secret knowledge. Our ancestors knew the secret. Now, Researchers at Cambridge University have discovered this one weird trick to improve performance. Expensive training programs don't want you to know this easy way to succeed. Click here to learn the $5 trick that will put you head and shoulders above the rest. 4C. Defensive slip-on undersocks. The natural way to protect yourself against attack. No poison, no pellets, no powders. Entirely efficient protection against electricity. Simply put these rubber socks on under your normal shoes and socks. No one need know you're wearing them, and unlike a shoe, they cannot easily be removed by an assailant. Two supplied per pack. Absorbent lining locks away foot moisture. Six years to go. Tunde. Tatiana Moskalev was right, and she'd given him good information. He spent two months investigating in the hills of northern Moldova, or the country that used to be Moldova and is currently at war with the southern part of itself, carefully questioning and bribing the people he met there. Reuters footed his bill on this occasion. He told an editor he trusted about the tip he'd got, and she signed off his costs. If he found it, it would be the biggest kind of news. If he didn't find it, he'd be able to do a portrait of this war-torn country, and that'd give them something at least. But he found it. One afternoon, a man in a village near the border agreed to drive Tunde in his jeep to a place on the river Nista, with a view down into the valley. There, they saw a compound hastily thrown up, with low-slung buildings and a central training yard. The man would not let Tunde leave the jeep, and he wouldn't drive any closer. But they had a good enough view for Tunde to take six photographs. 
They showed brown-skinned men with beards in battle fatigues and black berets, training with a new weapon, new armor. Their bodysuits were made of rubber. On their backs they wore battery packs, and in their hands they carried electric cattle prods. It was only six photographs, but it was enough. Tunde had made world news. A Wadi Atif trained secret army, was the Reuters headline. Others shouted, the boys are back, and look who's shocking. There were anxious debates in newsrooms and on morning shows about the implications of these new weapons. Could they work? Would they win? Tunde hadn't managed to photograph King Awadi Atif himself, but the conclusion that he was working with the Moldovan defense forces was unavoidable. The situation had begun to stabilize in many countries, but this news kicked it off again. Perhaps the men were coming back, with their weapons and armor. In Delhi, the riot went on for weeks. It began in the places under the motorway bridges where the poor people live in blanket tents or houses constructed from cardboard and tape. This is the place men come when they want a woman they can use without law or license, discard without censure. The power has been passed from palm to palm here for three years now. And the many death-bearing hands of women have a name here. Kali, the Eternal. Kali, who destroys to bring fresh growth. Kali, intoxicated by the blood of the slain. Kali, who puts out the stars with her thumb and forefinger. Terror is her name, and death is her breathing in and out. Her arrival in this world has been long expected. Any adjustment in understanding had come easily to the women under the motorway bridges of the megacity. The government sent in the army. The women of Delhi discovered a new trick. A jet of water, directed at the attacking forces, could be electrified. The women put their hands into the spouts and sent death from their fingers, like the goddess walking the earth. The government cut off the water supply to the slum neighborhoods in the highest heat of the summer, when the streets stink of rot and the pregnant dogs wander, panting, in search of shelter from the sun. The world's media filmed the poor begging for water praying for a single drop. And on the third day, the heavens opened and sent an unseasonal rainstorm, hectic and thorough as a scouring brush, washing the smell from the streets and collecting in puddles and pools. When the soldiers return, they are standing in the wet, or touching wet rails, or their vehicles are trailing some loose wire into the wet. And when the women light up the roadways, people die quite suddenly falling to the ground frothing, as though Kali herself had struck them down. The temples to Kali are full of worshippers. There are soldiers who join with the rioters, and Tunde is there too, with his cameras and his CNN pass. In the hotel filled with foreign journalists, people know him. He's seen some of these reporters before, in other places where justice is at last being meted out, although it's not considered good form to say so. Officially in the West, the thing is still a crisis, with all the word implies, exceptional, deplorable, temporary. The team from Algemeine Zeitung greet him by name, congratulate him, with a slightly envious tone, on the scoop of the six photographs of Awadi Atif's forces. He's met the more senior editors and producers from CNN, even a team from the Daily Times of Nigeria, who ask him where he's been hiding and how they could have missed him. Tunde has his own YouTube channel now, broadcasting footage from around the world. His face begins each broadcast. He is the one who goes to the most dangerous places to bring the images no one else will show. He celebrated his 26th birthday on a plane. One of the air stewards recognized his face and brought him champagne. In Delhi, he follows behind a pack of women rampaging through Janpath Market. There was a time that a woman could not walk alone here, not if she were under seventy, and not with certainty even then. There had been protests for many years, and placards and shouted slogans. These things rise up, and afterwards it is as if it had never been. Now, the women are making what they call a show of force, in solidarity with those who were killed under the bridges 
and starved of water. Tunde interviews a woman in the crowd. She had been here for the protest three years earlier. Yes, she had held up her banner and shouted and signed her petitions. It was like being a part of a wave of water, she says. A wave of spray from the ocean feels powerful, but it is only there for a moment. The sun dries the puddles and the water is gone. Then you feel maybe it never happened. That is how it was with us. The only wave that changes anything is a tsunami. You have to tear down the houses and destroy the land if you want to be sure no one will forget you. He knows exactly where this part will fit in his book. The history of political movements. The struggle that moved so slowly until this great change happened. He's putting together an argument. There is little violence against people. Mostly, they are turning over stalls. No, they will know, shouts one woman into Tunde's camera, that they are the ones who should not walk out of their houses alone at night. They are the ones who should be afraid. There is a brief scuffle when four men with knives appear in the crowd, but this is quickly dealt with, leaving the men with twitching arms, but no permanent injuries. He has started to suspect that there will be nothing new here today, nothing that hasn't been seen before. When the word comes through the crowd that the army have formed a barricade up ahead, across Windsor Place, they are trying to protect the foreign hotels. They're advancing slowly, armed with rubber bullets and shoes with thick, insulating soles. They want to make a demonstration here, a show of force to let the world see how a properly trained army deals with a rabble like this. Tunde doesn't really know any of the women in this crowd. There is no one who would shelter him in her home if the army came. The crowd is becoming more tightly pressed together. It has happened so gradually, he barely noticed it. But it makes sense, now he knows that the army is trying to squeeze them all into one place. And then what will happen? People will die here today. He feels it up his spine and into the crown of his head. There are shouts from up ahead. He doesn't speak enough of the language to understand. Tunde's usual mild smile fades from his face. He has to get away from here. Has to find high ground. He looks around. Delhi is constantly under construction, most of it unsafe. There are buildings from which the scaffolding has never been removed, shop fronts that slant awkwardly. Even some half-collapsed places still partly inhabited. There. Two streets up. There's a boarded-up shop behind a wagon selling paratas. A kind of wood scaffolding is fixed to the side of the building. The roof is flat. He shoulders his way through the crowd urgently. Most of the women are still trying to move forward, shouting and waving their banners. There's the hiss and crackle of electrical discharge somewhere further ahead. He can feel it in the air now. He knows what it feels like. The scents of the street, the dog shit and the mango pickle, and the body odor of the crowd and the frying bindi with cardamom become more intense for a moment. Everyone pauses. Tunde pushes forward still. He says to himself, This is not the day you die, Tunde. This is not that day. It'll be a funny story to tell your friends back home. It'll go into the book. Don't be afraid. Just keep moving. You'll get good footage from a high vantage point if you can just find a way up there. The lowest hanging piece of scaffold is a little too high for him to reach, even by jumping. Further up the street, he sees that other people have had the same idea, are climbing onto the roofs or into the trees. Some others are trying to pull them down. If he doesn't get up there now, he could be overwhelmed in a few minutes by others trying to take his place. He yanks over three old fruit boxes, piles them on top of each other, takes a long splinter in his thumb as he does it but doesn't care climbs on top of the boxes, and leaps. Mrs. comes down heavily, the shock sending a jolt of pain through his knees. These boxes won't last. The crowd is surging and chanting again. He jumps again, this time with more force, and... There! He's got it! Bottom rung of the scaffold ladder. Straining the muscles in his sides, he hauls himself up to the second rung, the third, and then he can scramble his feet up onto the rickety structure... And then it's easy. The scaffold sways as he climbs. 
It's not bolted to the walls of this crumbling concrete building. It was lashed with ropes once, but they frayed and rotted, and the strain of his climbing is pulling the fibers apart. Now this would be a stupid way to die. Not in a riot, not by an army bullet, not by Tatiana Moskalev taking him by the throat, just falling a dozen feet onto his back on a street in Delhi. He climbs faster, reaching the rough parapet as the whole structure sighs and swings more wildly from side to side. He clings to the parapet with one arm, feeling that splinter working its way into his thumb, kicks off with his legs and manages to jump half onto the roof so that his right arm and right leg are wrapped around the parapet and his body is swinging above the street. There are screens from further along the street and pops of gunfire. He pushes again with his left leg, just giving himself enough momentum to flop backward onto the gravel roof of the building. He lands in a puddle, soaking him through to the skin. But he's safe. He hears the creak and crack as the whole wooden structure finally gives up and crashes to the ground. That's it, Tunde. No way back down. On the other hand, no chance of being overwhelmed by crowds escaping the crush up here. Actually, it's perfect. Like it was meant to work out this way for him. He smiles, breathes out slowly. He can set up his camera here, film the whole thing. He's not afraid anymore. He's excited. There's nothing he could do anyway. No authorities to call and no boss to check in with. Just him and his cameras, up here out of the way. And something's going to happen. He sits up and looks around, and it's then he sees there's a woman there, with him, on the rooftop. She's in her mid-forties, wiry with small hands and a long thick plait like an oiled rope. She's looking at him, or not quite at him. She flicks him glances, looks to the side. He smiles, she smiles back, and in that smile, he can tell with certainty that there's something wrong with her. It's the way she's holding her head to the side, the way she's not looking at him and then suddenly staring at him. Are you... He looks down at the surging crowd in the street. There's the sound of gunfire, nearer now. Sorry if this is your place. I'm just waiting here till it's safe to go down. That all right? She nods, slowly. He tries a smile. Not looking good down there. You come up here to hide? She speaks slowly and carefully. Her accent's not bad. She could be saner than he thought. I was looking for you. He thinks for a moment she means that she knows his voice from the internet that she has seen his photograph. He half smiles, a fan. She kneels down, dabbles her fingers in the puddle of water he's still sitting in. He thinks she's trying to wash her hands until the shock hits his shoulder and his whole body begins to tremble. It's so sudden and so quick that for a moment he imagines it must have been a mistake. She's not meeting his eyes, she's looking away. The pain bleeds across his back and down his legs. There are scribbles of pain drawing a tree across his side. It's hard to breathe. He's on his hands and knees. He has to get out of the water. He says, stop, don't do that. His own voice surprises him. It's petulant, pleading. He sounds like someone more afraid than he feels himself to be. It's going to be fine. He's going to get away. He starts to back up. Beneath them, the crowd is yelling. There are screams. If he can just make her stop this, he'll get some amazing shots of the street, the fighting. The woman still stirring the water with her fingers. Her eyes are rolling in her head. He says, I'm not here to hurt you. It's okay. We can just wait up here together. She laughs then. Several barks of laughter. He rolls over, crawls backwards out of the pool of water, watches her. Now he's afraid. It was the laughing that did it. She smiles, a bad, wide smile. Her lips are wet. He tries to stand up, but his legs are shaking, and he can't quite manage it. He collapses onto one knee. She watches him, nodding, like she's thinking, 
Yes, this is expected. Yes, this is the way it goes. He looks around the rooftop. There's not much. There's a rickety bridge across to another roof. Just a plank. He wouldn't like to cross it. She could kick it over as he walked. But if he grabbed it, he could use it as a weapon, fend her off at least. He starts to crawl towards it. She says a few words in a language he doesn't know, then very quietly. Are we in love? She licks her lips. He can see her skein twitching at her collarbone, a living worm. He moves faster. He is faintly aware that there are other people watching them from the rooftop across the road, people pointing and calling out. There's not much they can do from there. Maybe video it? How much good will that do him? He tries standing again, but his legs are still trembling from the aftershocks, and she laughs when she sees him try. She lunges for him. He tries to kick her in the face with his shoe, but she grabs the exposed ankle and gets him again. A long, high arc. It feels like a meat cleaver wielded in a solid and practiced stroke all down his thigh and calf, separating the flesh from the bone. He can smell the hair on his legs, burning. There is a scent, like spices, something wafting up from the street, roasting meat in the smoke of dripping animal fats and burned bones. He thinks of his mother, reaching into the pot to test the grains of parboiled rice between her fingertips. Too hot for you, Tundi. Get your hands away. He can smell the sweet hot aroma of the jollof rice bubbling on the stove. Your brain is jangled, Tundi. Remember what they say about this. Your mind is made of meat and electrics. This thing hurts more than it should because it short circuits your brain. You are confused. You are not at home. Your mother will not come. She has him on the ground now. She is wrestling with his belt and his jeans. She's trying to pull them down without undoing the buckle, and they're too tight to come over his hips. His back is scraping on the gravel. He can feel the edge of a wet concrete block in the small of his back, rubbing him raw, and he keeps thinking, if I fight her off too hard, she'll knock me unconscious, and then she can do whatever she wants. There is shouting now from far off, as if he were underwater, his ears clogged. At first he thinks he is hearing the shouting from the street. He is ready for another shock. His body is tensed for it. And it is only when the shock does not come, when he realizes he is fighting with the air, that he opens his eyes and sees that three other women have pulled her off him. They must have crossed on the plank bridge from the building next door. They have thrown her down, and they are shocking her time and again, but she will not lie still. Tunde pulls his trousers back up and waits watching until that woman with her long, thick, oiled plait has stopped moving altogether. Ali Excerpt from the forum Freedom of Reach, a nominally libertarian website. Asked and answered. Major, major, major news out of South Carolina. Look at the photos. Here's one of Mother Eve. It's a screen grab from the vid Towards Love, the one where her hood slips back a bit and you can see part of her face. See how the jaw is sort of pointed, and the relationship between the mouth and the nose compared to the bottom of the mouth to the chin. On the diagram, I've calculated the ratios. Now look at this photo. Someone on Urban Docs' forum has put up photos from a police investigation four years ago in Alabama. All signs are it's totally legit. Might have come from someone who wants justice, might have come from the police. Anyway, it's photos of an Allison Montgomery Taylor who murdered her adoptive father and was never found. It's very clear. The shape of the jaw is the same. The chin is the same. The ratio between the mouth and the nose and the mouth and the chin is the same. Just look and tell me that's not convincing. Buck you. Fuck. You've discovered that all human beings have mouths and noses and chins. That is going to blow the field of anthropology wide open there, fag. F is for freedom. These photos have very clearly been doctored. Look at the way that the light is shining in the picture of Allison M.T. Hits her cheek on the left-hand side and her chin on the right-hand side. Someone has pilt down man these pics to make your numbers add up. I call shenanigans. Angular Merkel. It's well known that it is Allison M.T., this has been reported to the police in Florida before, but she's got them paid off. 
They've been extorting money and threatening people all down the eastern seaboard. Eve and her nuns have joined up with fucking Jewish organized crime. This has been proven by Urban Docs and Ultra D. Check the threads on the May 11th riots and arrests in Raleigh before double posting this bullshit, dickwad. Man into many. Urban Docs' account was suspended for abuse, dickwad. Abrahamic. Yeah, I noticed that every single fucking post you've made has been supporting Urban Docs or two known sock puppets. You're either UD yourself or you're sucking his dick right now. San Sebastian. There's no way this wasn't her. The Israeli government is the one funding these new churches. They've been trying to bring down Christianity for centuries now, discrediting us, using the blacks to poison the inner cities with drugs. This new drug is just part of that. You know the new churches are distributing these Zionist drugs to our kids? Wake up, sheeple! This whole thing is already sewn up by the same old powers and systems. You think you're free because you could talk on a message board? Don't you think they're monitoring what we see here? Don't you think they know who each of us is? They don't mind us talking here, but if any of us ever seem like we were about to act, they've got enough on each of us to destroy us. Fuck you. Don't feed the trolls. Angela Merkel. Fucking conspiracy theory nutjobs. Loose kite talker. Not 100% wrong. Why do you think they're not cracking down harder on illegal downloading of movies? Why do you think they're not doing a search and block on porn sites, torrent sites? It'd be freaking easy. Anyone on here could code it up in an afternoon. You know why? Because if they need to take any of us out, send us to jail for a million years, they've got the power to do it. That's what the whole internet is, man. Fucking honey trap. And you think you're safe because you're using some sit-ass proxy or bouncing the signal through Bill Harad or Kirsten? The NSA's got deals sewn up with those people. They've paid off the police. They're in the servers. Matheson. Mod here. This board is not the place for discussion of net security. Suggest you take this post over to slash security. Loose kite talker. It is relevant here. Did any of you see the BB-97 vid from Moldova? Taken by our government in the USA, monitoring Awadi Atif's troop movements. Do you think they can see that and they can't see us? F is for freedom. So, uh, to get this back on topic, I don't think that can be Mother Eve. Allison M.T. is known to have fled on the night she killed her dad, 24th June. First sermons by Eve from Myrtle Bay are dated 2nd July. Are we really saying that Allison M.T. killed her dad and then jacked a car, crossed state lines, set up as a high priestess of a new religion and was delivering sermons ten days later? I don't buy it. Coincidence of facial recognition software picked this one up. Conspiracy theorists on Reddit went crazy for it. There's nothing there. Do I believe there's something weird about Eve? Sure. There are the same dark patterns as Scientology, as early Mormonism. Doublespeak. Bending old stuff to suit new ways of thinking, creating a new underclass. But murder? There's no evidence for that. Rise up. Wake up. Her people doctor the dates on those sermons to make them seem to go back earlier than they really do. There's no video of those early sermons, nothing on YouTube. They could have been made any time. If anything, this makes her look more guilty. Why would she have to pretend to have been in Myrtle Bay so early? Loose cat talker. Don't see how the Moldovan sat images are off topic. Mother E's been giving talks in South Moldova. She's building up a power base there. We know that the NSA is monitoring everything. Global terrorism hasn't gone anywhere. Seventeen near relatives of the king fled Saudi after the coup with more than eight trillion dollars in foreign holdings. House of Saud hasn't disappeared just because there's a woman sender in the Al Faisalia. You think there's no backlash coming? You think Awadi Atif doesn't want his fucking kingdom back? You think he's not sloshing his money around to anyone he thinks will help? Do you have any idea what the House of Saud has always funded? They fund terror, my friends. And with all that, you think there's no interest in domestic terror and counterterrorism? The NSA's monitoring everything we're saying here. Be certain of that. They'll have Eve under close surveillance. Man into many. 
Eve will be dead within three years, I guarantee it. Rise up. Dude, unless you're using a dozen VPNs at once, wait for your door to be knocked down in three, two, one. Angular Merkel. Someone's going to send in a hitman to do her. Electricity won't protect against bullets. Malcolm X, MLK, JFK. There's probably a contract on her already. Man into many. Those speeches she makes, I'd fucking murder the cunt for free. The Lord is watching. The government has been causing this change for years through carefully measured doses of hormones called vaccinations. Vac as in vacuous, sin as in our sinful souls, nation as in the once great people who have been destroyed by this. Click here for the expose no newspaper will publish. Ascension 229 There's going to come a reckoning. The Lord shall gather his people and he shall instruct them in his right way and in his glory. And this shall herald the end of days, when the righteous shall be gathered unto him, and the wicked shall perish in flames. Avery Falls Did you all see Alatunde Edo's reporting from Moldova? The Saudi army? Anyone else look at the pics of those fine young men and want to go and join up? Fight the war that's coming with the weapons they have. Make a difference, so when our grandsons ask what we did, we'll have something to tell them. Man into many. That's exactly what I thought. Only wish I were younger. If my son wanted to go, I'd wish him Godspeed. He's being fucked by a feminazi now, though. She's got her claws into him good and tight. Benengitis. I took my son to the mall yesterday. He's nine. I let him look around the toy store alone to pick something out. It was his birthday last week. He has birthday money and he's smart enough not to wander out of the door without me. But when I came to find him, there was a girl talking to him. Maybe 13, 14 years old. One of those tattoos on the palm of her hand. The hand of Fatima. I asked him what she'd said and he started crying and crying. He asked me if it was true that he was bad and that God wanted him to be obedient and humble. She was trying to convert my son in the fucking store. Fuck you. Fuck. Fuck, that is disgusting. Fucking stupid little lying bitch cunt. I would have hit her so hard she'd be sucking dick through her eyeballs. Vertical shit down. Dude, I have literally no idea what that even means. Man into many. You have a photo of her? Some kind of ID? There are people who can help you. Loose cat talker. What was the store? What was the exact time and place? We can find security footage. We can send her a message she won't forget. Man into many. PM me details of exactly where you met her and the name of the store. We're going to strike back against them. F is for freedom. Guys, I call false flag. A story like this, the OP could make you attack anyone with minimal evidence. Could be an attempt to provoke reciprocal action just to make us look like the bad guys. Man into many. Fuck off. We know these things happen. They've happened to us. We need a year of rage, just like they're saying. Bitches need to see a change. They need to learn what justice means. Urban Docs 933 There will be nowhere to hide. There will be nowhere to run to. There will be no mercy. Margo. Now tell me, Madam Mayor, were you elected governor of this great state, what would your plans be to tackle the budget deficit? There are three points to this. She knows it. She has the first two right off. I have a simple three-point plan, Kent. Number one, trim the overspend on bureaucracy. That's good. That's the one to hit them with first. Did you know that current Governor Daniel Dandon's Office for Environmental Oversight spent more than $30,000 last year on, what was it, bottled water? A pause to let that sink in. Number two, cut aid to those who really don't need it. If your income is over $100,000 a year, this state should not be paying to send your kids to summer camp. This is a misrepresentation, followed by a gross misrepresentation. This provision would only apply to 2,000 families statewide, and most of those have disabled kids, 
which would exempt them from means testing anyway. Still, it plays well, and mentioning kids reminds people that she has a family, while saying she'll cut welfare payments makes her seem tough, not just another woman in office with a soft, bleeding heart. Now the third plank. The third. The third plank. Point three, she says, in the hope that the words will find themselves on her tongue if she just keeps talking. Point three, she says again, a little more firmly. Fuck, she doesn't have it. Come on, cutting bureaucracy, cutting unnecessary welfare payments, and... and... Fuck! Fuck, Alan, I've lost point three. Alan stretches, stands up and rolls his neck. Alan, tell me point three. If I tell you, you'll just forget it again on stage. Fuck you, Alan! Yeah, you kiss your kids with that mouth. They can't tell the fucking difference. Margot, do you want this? Do I want this? Would I be going through all this prep if I didn't want it? Alan sighs. You know, Margot, somewhere in there, somewhere inside your head, you have point three of your budget deficit program. Reach out for me, Margot. Find it. She stares at the ceiling. They're in the dining room, with a podium mocked up next to the television set. Maddie's little handprint paintings are framed on the wall. Jocelyn's already demanded hers be taken down. It'll be different when we're actually live, she says. I'll have the adrenaline then, I'll be more. She does jazz hands. Peppy. Yeah, you'll be so peppy that when you can't remember the third plank of your budget reform, you'll throw up live on stage. Pep. Super pep. Puke. Bureaucracy, welfare, and... Bureaucracy, welfare... Infrastructure investment! She yells it out. The current administration has refused to invest in our infrastructure. Our schools are crumbling, our roads are poorly maintained, and we need to spend money to make money. I've shown that I can manage large-scale projects. Our North Star camps for girls have been replicated in 12 states now. They create jobs, they keep girls off the streets, and they've given us one of the lowest rates of street violence in the country. Infrastructure investment will make our people confident in a secure future ahead of them. That's it. That was it. There. And isn't it true, Madam Mayor, says Alan? that you have worrying ties with private military corporations? Margot smiles. Only if public and private initiatives working hand in hand make you worried, Kent. North Star Systems are one of the most well-respected companies in the world. They run private security for many heads of state, and they're an American business, just the kind of business we need to provide jobs for hard-working families. And tell me, her smile positively twinkles, would I send my own daughter to a North Star day camp if I thought they were anything other than a force for good? There's a slow round of applause in the room. Margot hadn't even noticed that Jocelyn's come in by the side door, that she's been listening. That was great, Mom. Really great. Margot laughs. You should have seen me a few minutes ago. I couldn't even remember the names of all the school districts in the state. I've known those off by heart for ten years. You just need to relax. Come and have a soda. Margot glances at Alan. Yeah, yeah, take ten minutes. Jocelyn smiles. Joss is doing better now. Better than she was, anyway. Two years of North Star Camp have helped. The girls there have taught her how to tone down the highs. It's been months since she last blew up a light bulb, and she's using her computer again without fear of fritzing it. They haven't helped her lows, though. There are still days, up to a week sometimes, when she has no power at all. They've tried linking it to what she eats, to her sleep, to her periods, to exercise, but they can't find a pattern. Some days, some weeks, she's got nothing. Quietly. Margot's talking to a couple of health insurance providers about funding some research. The state government would be very grateful for their assistance, even more so if she becomes governor.
Joss takes a hand as they walk through the den towards the kitchen. Squeezes it. Joss says, So, uh, Mom? This is Ryan. There's a boy, standing awkwardly in the hall, hands in his pockets, pile of books on the side. His dirty blonde hair is falling into his eyes. Hmm, a boy. Well, okay. Parenting never stops bringing new challenges. Hi, Ryan. Good to meet you. She extends a hand. Nice to meet you, Mayor Cleary, he mumbles. At least he's polite. Could be worse. How old are you, Ryan? Nineteen. A year older than Jocelyn. And how did you meet my daughter, Ryan? Mom? Ryan blushes. Actually blushes. She'd forgotten how young some 19-year-old boys are. Maddie's 14 years old and already practicing military stances in the mudroom and doing the moves she's seen on TV or that Joss has taught her from the camp. Her power hasn't even come in yet, and she seems older than this kid standing in the hallway, staring at his shoes and blushing. We met at the mall, says Joss. We hung out. We drank sodas. We're just gonna do homework together. Her tone is pleading. Ryan's going to Georgetown in the fall. Pre-med. Everyone wants to date a doctor, huh? She smiles. Mom! Margot pulls Jocelyn close to her, hand in the small of her back, kisses the top of her head, and whispers very quietly in her ear. I want your bedroom door open, okay? Jocelyn stiffens. Just until we've had time to discuss it. Just today. Okay? Okay, whispers Joss. I love you. Margot kisses her again. Joss takes Ryan's hand. Love you too, Mom. Ryan picks up his books awkwardly with one hand. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Clurry. And then I look across his face like he knows he's not supposed to call her Mrs., like he's been schooled in it. I mean, Mayor Clurry. Nice to meet you too, Ryan. Dinner's at 6.30, okay? And they go upstairs. That was it. The start of the new generation. Alan's watching from the door to the den. Young love? Margot shrugs. Young something, anyway. Young hormones. Nice to know some things don't change. Margot looks up through the stairwell to the upper floor. What did you mean before, when you asked me if I wanted it? It's just aggression, Margot. You need to attack on those questions. You have to show you're hungry for it. Do you understand? I do want it. Why? Margot thinks of Jocelyn, shaking when her power switches off, and how no one can tell them what's wrong with it. She thinks of how much faster she'd be able to get things done as governor without Daniel standing in her way. For my daughters, she says. I wanted to help Joss. Alan frowns. Okay, then, he says. Back to work. Upstairs, Joss pulls the door closed, turns the handle so softly that even her mother couldn't hear it. She'll be down there for hours she says. Ryan's sitting on the bed. He circles her wrist with his thumb and forefinger, tugs at her to sit next to him. Hours, he says, and smiles. Joss slants her shoulders one way, then the other. She's got all this stuff to memorize, and Maddie's with Dad till the weekend. She puts her hand on his thigh. She makes slow circles with her thumb. Do you mind? says Ryan. That she's busy with all this stuff, I mean. Joss shakes her head. I mean, is it weird? He says, with the press and everything. She scratches at the fabric of his jeans with her nails. His breathing speeds up. You get used to it, she says. Mom always says, our family is still private. Anything that happens behind closed doors is just between us. Cool, he says. He smiles. 
I don't want to be on the evening news is all. And she finds that so adorable that she leans in and kisses him. They've done this before, but it's still so new. And they've never done it before somewhere with a door and a bed. She's been afraid that she'd hurt someone again. Sometimes she can't stop thinking of that boy she put in hospital, the way the hairs on his arms crisped and how he held his ears like the sound was too loud. She's talked about all this with Ryan. He understands like no boy she's ever met before. They've talked about how they'll take their time and won't let it get out of control. The inside of his mouth is so warm and so wet, and his tongue is so slippery. He moans, and she can feel the thing starting to build up in her. But she's okay. She's done her breathing exercises. She knows she can control it. Her hands are on his back, and down past his belt, and his hands are tentative at first, but then more confident, grazing the side of her breast, then his thumb on her neck and at her throat. She has a fizzing, popping feeling across her collar and a heavy ache between her legs. He pulls away for a moment, frightened, excited. I can feel it, he says. Show it to me. She smiles, breathless. Show me yours? They're both laughing then. She unbuttons her shirt. First button, second button, third, down to where the edge of her bra starts to be visible. He's smiling. He pulls off his sweater, unbuttons the undershirt beneath it. One. Two, three buttons. He runs the tips of his fingers along her collarbone, where her skein is thrumming slightly under her skin, excited and ready. And she lifts her hand, touches his face. He's smiling. Go on. She feels from the point of his collar along the bone. She cannot feel it at first. But then. There it is. Faint but glittering. There's his skein, too. They had met in the mall. That part was perfectly true. Jocelyn has learned enough from being raised in a politician's house to know that you never lie outright if you can avoid it. They'd met in the mall because that's where they decided to meet, and they decided it in a private chat room online, both of them looking for people like them. Weird people. People in whom the thing hadn't taken right, one way or the other. Jocelyn had looked at the horrible Urban Docks site some stranger had emailed her, all about how this thing is the start of a holy war between men and women. Urban Docks had one blog post where he talked about sites for deviants and abnormals. Jocelyn had thought, that's me. That's where I should go. Afterwards, she was amazed she hadn't thought of it before. Ryan, from what they can tell, is even more rare than Jocelyn. He has a chromosomal irregularity. His parents have known about it since he was a few weeks old. Not all the boys like this grow skeins. Some of them died when their skeins tried to come in. Some of them have skeins that don't work. In any case, they keep it to themselves. There have been boys who've been murdered for showing their skein in other, harder parts of the world. On some of those websites for deviants and abnormals, people are wondering what would happen if you got the women to try to wake the power up in men, if you taught them the techniques that are already being used in the training camps to strengthen the power in weaker women. Some of them are saying, maybe more of us would have it if they tried. But most men aren't trying anymore, if they ever did. They don't want to be associated with this with weirdness, with chromosomal irregularity. Can you do it? Can you, he says. This is one of her good days. The power in her is even and measured. She can dole it out by the teaspoon. She sends a tiny portion into the side of him, not more than a jab in the ribs with an elbow. He makes a little sound, a noise of deliciousness. She smiles at him. Now you. He takes her hand in his. He strokes the middle of her palm. And then he does it. He's not as controlled as she is, and his power is much weaker. 
But there it is. Jittering. The power growing and waning, even over the three or four seconds he sustains it. But there. She sighs with the feeling of it. The power is very real. The feeling of it delineates the lines of the body very clearly. There is already so much porn of it. The single, dependable, human desire is very adaptable. What there is in humans is sexy. This, now, is what there is. Ryan watches her face as he sends his power into her hand, his eyes eager. She makes a little gasp. He likes it. When his power is spent, and he doesn't have much he never has had, he lies back on her bed. She lies next to him. Now, she says, are you ready? Yes, he says, now. And she touches his earlobe with the tip of one finger, brings the crackle to him, until he's writhing and laughing and begging her to stop and begging her to carry on. Joss quite likes girls. She quite likes boys who are a bit like girls. And Ryan was only a bus ride away. It was lucky. She messaged him privately. They met at the mall. They liked each other. They met two or three more times. Talked about it. Held hands. Made out. And she brought him back home. She thinks, I have a boyfriend. She looks at his skein. It's not pronounced at all, not like hers. She knows what some of the girls from North Star Camp would say, but she finds it sexy. She places her lips to his collarbone and feels the vibration beneath the skin. She kisses her way along it. He is like her, but unlike her. She sticks her tongue between her teeth and licks him where he tastes like battery. Downstairs, Margot is on to much-needed support for vulnerable seniors. She's using almost all of her attention to remember her lines. But a little part of her brain is still worrying over that question Alan asked her. Does she want it? Is she hungry for it? Why does she want it? She thinks of Joss and how she'd be able to help her if she had more power and influence. She thinks of the state and how she'd be able to change things for the better. But as her fingers grip the cardboard podium and the charge begins to build across her collarbone almost involuntarily while she speaks, the real reason is that she can't stop thinking of the look she'd see on Daniel's face if she got it. She wants it because she wants to knock him down. Roxy Mother Eve had heard a voice saying, One day, there'll be a place for the woman to live freely. And now she's getting hundreds of thousands of hits from that new country, where women had until recently been chained in basements on dirty mattresses. They're setting up new churches in her name, without her having had to send a single missionary or envoy. Her name means something in Besapara, an email from her, means even more. And Roxy's dad knows people on the Moldovan border. He's been doing business with them for years. Not in flesh, that's a dirty trade. But cars, cigarettes, booze, guns, even a bit of art. Leaky borders a leaky border. With all the disruption recently, it's got leakier than ever. Roxy says to her dad, Send me to this new country, Besapara. Send me there and I can get something going. I've got an idea. Listen, says Shanti. You want to try something new? There are eight of them. Four women, four men, all mid-twenties, in the basement flat in Primrose Hill. Bankers. One of the men already has his hand up one of the women's skirt, which Shanti could fucking do without. She knows her audience, though. Something new is their rallying cry. Their mating call, their 6 a.m. wake-up call with newspaper and organic pomegranate juice, because orange is so 1980s high glycemic load. They love something new more than they love collateralized debt obligations. For example, says one of the men, counting out the pills they've already bought. 
checking he hasn't been cheated, cunt. Uh-uh, says Shanty. Not for you. This is directly for the ladies. There's a crowing, whistling cheer at that. She shows them a little dime bag of powder. It's white with a purplish sheen to it. Like snow, like frost, like the tops of mountains in some fancy fucking ski resort where these guys go on the weekend to drop 25 quid on a mug of hot chocolate and bang each other on endangered fur rugs in front of fires carefully constructed at 5 a.m. by underpaid chalet workers. Glitter, she says. She licks the top of her index finger, dips it into the bag and picks up a few shining crystals, opens her mouth and lifts her tongue to show them what she's doing, rubs the powder into one of the thick blue veins at the base of the tongue, offers the bag to the ladies. The ladies dip in eagerly, scooping up great fingerfuls of whatever it is that Shanty's offering and rubbing it round their mouths. Shanty waits for them to feel it. Oh, wow, says a systems analyst with a blunt bob. Lucy, Charlotte, they all have roughly the same name. Oh, wow, oh, God, I think I'm going to... And she starts to crackle at the end of her fingertips. It's not enough to get her hurting anyone, but she's lost control a bit. Usually, when you're drunk or stoned, or high on most things, the power is damped down. A drunk woman might get off a jolt or two, but nothing you couldn't dodge if you weren't drunk, too. This is different. This is calibrated. This is designed to enhance the experience. There's some coke cut in with it, that's already known to make the power more pronounced, and a couple of different kinds of uppers, along with the thing that gives it the purple glint, which Shanty's only ever seen post-cut. Something coming out of Moldova, she's heard, or Romania, or Bessapara, or Ukraine, one of those. Shanty's got a bloke she deals with in a lock-up garage out towards the coast in Essex, and when this stuff started coming in, she knew she could move it. The women start laughing. They're loose-limbed and excited, leaning back, making high, low-powered arcs from one hand to another or up to the ceiling. It'd feel nice to have them do one of those arcs on you. Shanty's got her girlfriend to take some and do it to her. Not painful, but fizzing tickling at the nerve endings, like taking a shower in San Pellegrino, which these fuckers probably do anyway. One of the men pays her in cash for four more bags. She charges them double, eight crisp fifties, don't get those from a hole in the wall, because they're dickheads. No one offers to walk her down to her car. When she lets herself out, two of them are already fucking, giggling, letting off starbursts with every thrust and jerk. Steve's nervous, because there's been a change in the security guard's rotor. And it could be nothing, right? It could be some fucker's had a baby, some other fucker's got the shits. Then it all looks different from the outside, even when it's entirely okay. And you'll be able to walk in just like normal and get your fucking hourglasses just like fucking normal. The problem is, there's been a story in the paper. Not a big story, not page one, but... Page five in the mirror and the express and the daily fucking mail about this new death drug that's killing young men with their whole lives ahead of them. It's in the paper, but there's no fucking law against it yet, not unless it's cut with something else, which this stuff in the fucking hourglasses is. So fuck it. What's he gonna do? Stand out here like a lemon, waiting to see if PC Plod is waiting by the docks, to see if those guards he hasn't ever had a chat or a drink with See if one of those is a copper. He pulls his cap down low over his eyes. He drives the van up to the gate. Yeah, he goes. I've got boxes to pick up from container. He stops to look up the number, even though he knows it like it's tattooed inside his fucking eyelids. A G 21 F E 7 138 59 D. There's a crackle on the intercom. Bloody hell, says Steve, trying to sound conversational. These bloody numbers get longer every week, I tell ya. There's a long pause. If it was Chris or Marky or that Bell End Jeff in the gatehouse, they'd know him and let him in. Can you come up to the window, driver? Says a woman's voice through the intercom. We need to see your ID and pick up forms. Fuck. So he drives round to the gatehouse. What else is he going to do? He's come through loads of times, 
Most of those pickups are legitimate. He does a bit of import-export. Kids toys for market store holders. Has a little business, turns a handy profit. Cash transactions, a lot of it, and not all on the books. He sits up nights, making up names of stall holders he's sold to. Bernie Monk set him up with a stall himself down Peckham Market. He's down there on a Saturday to make the thing look legit, because you don't want to get stupid. Nice toys, a lot of them, wooden, from Eastern Europe. And the air glasses. Of course, they've never called him round the gatehouse when he's been shifting little wood robots held together with elastics, or them carved ducks on a string. They've got to fucking call him in for this. There's a woman there he's never seen before. Big glasses on her face, halfway up her forehead and right down past the end of her nose. Owl glasses. Steve wishes he'd had a bit of something himself, just a little bit before he came out. Can't carry any in the van, it'd be stupid. They've got sniffer dogs. That's the good thing about these hourglasses. Egg timers. He didn't understand it when Bernie showed him. Bernie tipped the egg timer thing over. The sand fell through, golden and soft. Bernie said, Don't be a muppet. What do you think's inside here? Sand? Inside the glass. And that glass inside another glass tube. Double sealed. Wash them all down with rubbing alcohol before they go in the boxes. And Bob's your uncle. Nothing for the sniffer dogs to get hold of. You'd have to smash one of those egg timers open before the dogs could tell what it was. Paperwork, she says, and he hands it over. He makes a joke about the fucking weather, but she doesn't even crack a smile. She looks through the manifest. A couple of times she gets him to read out a word or a number to her, to make sure she's got it right. Behind her, he sees Jeff's face for a few moments against the security glass of the back door. Jeff makes a sorry mate face and shakes his head at the back of the hard-arsed woman. Fuck. Can you come with me, please? She motions Steve towards a private office off to the side. What's the problem? Steve jokes to the world at large, although there's no one there. Can't get enough of me. Still doesn't smile. Fuck, fuck, fuck! There's something in the paperwork's made her suspicious. He's done it all himself, that paperwork. He knows it's right. She's heard something. She's been sent in by the narc. She knows something. She motions him to sit opposite her at the small table. She sits too. What's this all about, love? He says. Only I'm due in Bermondsey in an hour and a half. She grabs his wrist and puts her thumb to the place between the small bones, just where the hand joins the arm. And suddenly, it's on fire. Flames inside his bones, the veins shriveling, curling up, blackening. Fuck! She's going to pull his hand off. Don't say anything, she says. And he won't. He couldn't, not if he tried. Roxy Monk's taken over this business now. You know who she is. You know who her dad is. Don't say nothing, just nod. Steve nods. He knows. You've been skimming, Steve. He tries to shake his head, to gabble. No, 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 you got it wrong. It weren't me. But she presses the pain into his wrist so he thinks she's going to crack it open. Every month, she says, just one or two of them egg timers don't get listed on your books. You get me, Steve? He nods. And it stops now, right? Right now, or you're out of this business. Understand? He nods. She lets him go. He cradles his wrist in his other hand. You can't even see on the skin that anything's happened to him. Good, she says, because we got something special this month. Don't try to move it till you hear from us. Okay. Yeah, he says. Yeah. He drives off with 800 egg timers neatly packaged up in boxes in the back of his van. All the paperwork correct. Every carton accounted for. He doesn't take a look till he's back at his lockup and he's taken the edge off the pane. Yeah, he can see it. There is something different. All the sand in these hourglasses is tinged with purple. Rox is counting money. She could get one of the girls to do it. They've already done it once and she could call someone in to count it up in front of her. But she likes doing it herself, feeling the paper under her fingertips, watching her decisions turn into maths, turn into power. Bernie said to her more than once, the day someone else knows where your money's going better than you do, that's the day you've lost.
It's like a magic trick, money. You can turn money into anything. One, two, three, presto! Turn drugs into influence with Tatiana Moskalev, president of Bessapara. Turn your ability to bring pain and fear into a factory, where the authorities will turn a blind eye to whatever you're cooking up there that sends purple-tinged steam into the skies at midnight. Ricky and Bernie had had some ideas for what Roxy should do when she got home. Fencing, maybe. Or one of the fronts up in Manchester. But she had an idea for Bernie that was bigger than anything he'd heard in a long time. She's known for a while now what to ask for to make her last the longest, and how to mix it up. Roxy sat on a hillside for days off her face, trying out different combinations her dad's people had concocted for her approval. When they found it, they knew it. A purple crystal, as big as rock salt, fiddled about with by chemists and derived originally from the bark of the Dahoni tree, which is native to Brazil, but which grows pretty well here too. A snort of the full thing, pure glitter, and Roxy could send a blast halfway across the valley. That's not what they ship. Too dangerous, too valuable. They save the good stuff for private use, and maybe for the right bidder. What they're shipping is already cut, but they've done well. Roxy hasn't mentioned Mother Eve to her family, but it's because of the new churches that they've got 70 loyal women working on their production line already. Women who think they're doing the work of the Almighty, bringing power to her children. She tells Bernie the week's totals herself, every week. She does it in front of Ricky and Daryl if they're there. She doesn't care. She knows what she's doing. The Monk family are the sole suppliers of glitter right now. They're printing money. And money can turn into anything. On email, a private account bounced around a dozen servers. Roxy tells Mother Eve the weekly totals, too. Not bad, says Eve. And you're keeping some back from me? For you and yours, says Roxy, just like we agreed. You set us up here, you're making my fortune. You look after us, and we'll look after you. She grins as she types it. She's thinking to herself, take the whole thing. It belongs to you. Audio guide for the Museum of Post-Cataclysm Artifacts. This roped-off area contains casts of several skeletons. The cast was taken before the remains were moved, so visitors can see how these unfortunate men were lying when they died. The display text reads, Mass grave of male skeletons found in a recent excavation of the post-London village conglomeration. The hands were removed pre-mortem. The marked skulls are typical of the period. The scars were incised post-mortem. Approximately 2,000 years old. Five years to go. Margot. The candidate is puffing himself up in the mirror. He rolls his neck from side to side. He opens his mouth very wide and says, La, 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 la. He catches his own Caribbean ocean blue eyes, smiles faintly, and winks. He mouths at the mirror. You've got this. Morrison gathers his notes, and attempting not to meet the candidate's direct gaze, says, Mr. Danden, Daniel, sir, you've got this. The candidate smiles. That's just what I was thinking, Morrison. Morrison smiles back thinly. That's because it's true, sir. You're the incumbent. This belongs to you already. It does a candidate good to think that there's some lucky omen stars aligning thing going on. Morrison likes to pull these little tricks off if he can. That's what makes him good at his job. It's that kind of thing that makes it just that little bit more likely that his guy will beat the other guy. The other guy is a gal, almost ten years younger than Morrison's candidate. Hard-edged and hard-nosed, and they'd pushed her on that in the weeks of campaigning. I mean, she's divorced after all, and with those two girls to raise, 
Can a woman like that really find time for political office? Someone had asked Morrison if he thought politics had changed since the, you know, since the big change. Morrison put his head to one side and said, No, the key issues are still the same. Good policies and good character, and let me tell you, our candidate has both. And so he went on, guiding the conversation back round to its safely railed-in scenic route, past Mount Education and Healthcare Point, via Values Boulevard and Self-Made Man Gully. But in the privacy of his own mind, he admitted to himself that yes, it had changed. If he'd allowed the odd voice in the center of his skull operational control over his mouth, which he'd never do, he knew better than that. But if he'd said it, it would have said, They're waiting for something to happen. We're only pretending everything is normal because we don't know what else to do. The candidates hit the floor like Travolta, ready with their moves, knowing that the spotlight is going to find them and illuminate every glistening thing, both sequins and sweat. She hits it out of the park with the first question, which is defense. She's got her facts at her fingertips. She's been running that North Star project for years, of course. He should push her on that. But his guy's just not quite so easy with his comebacks. Come on, Mads Morrison at no one in particular because the lights are too bright for the candidate to see him. Come on, attack! The candidate stumbles over his answer, and Morrison feels it like a punch to the gut. Second question and the third are on statewide issues. Morrison's candidate sounds competent, but boring. And that's a killer. By question seven and eight, she has him on the ropes again, and he doesn't fight back when she says he doesn't have the vision for the job. By this point, Morrison's wondering if it's possible for a candidate to lose so badly that some of the shit really will spray off onto him. It might seem as if he's been sitting around eating M&Ms and scratching his ass for the past few months. They go into the long commercial break with nothing left to lose. Morrison escorts the candidate to the bathroom and helps him to a little nose powder. He goes through the talking points and says, You're doing great, sir, really great, but you know... Aggression's no bad thing. The candidate says, Now, now, I can't come across as angry. And Morrison grabs him right there in the stool, grabs him by the arm and says, Sir, do you want that woman to give you a pasting tonight? Think of your dad and what he'd want to see. Stand up for what he believed in, for the America he wanted to build. Think, sir, of how he would have handled this. Daniel Danden's father who was a business bruiser with a borderline alcohol problem, died 18 months ago. It's a cheap trick. Cheap tricks often work. The candidate rolls his shoulders like a prize fighter, and they're back for the second half. The candidate's a different man now, and Morrison doesn't know if it was the coke or the pep talk, but either way, he thinks, well, I'm a hell of a guy. The candidate comes out fighting on question after question. Unions, boom. Minority rights, he sounds like the natural heir to the Founding Fathers, and she comes off as defensive. It's good. It's really good. That's when Morrison and the audience notice something. Her hands are clenching and unclenching, as if she were trying to stop herself. But she can't be. It's impossible. She's been tested. The candidate's on a roll now, he says, and those subsidies? Your own figures show that they're completely out of whack. There's a noise from the audience, but the candidate takes it as a sign that they approve of his strong attack. He goes in for the kill. In fact, your policy is not only out of whack, it's 40 years old. She's passed her own test with flying colors. It can't be. But her hands are gripping the side of the podium, and she's saying, Now, 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 you can't just, now, now as if she were pointing out every moment as it passed. But everyone can see what she's trying not to do. Everyone except the candidate. The candidate goes for a devastating move. Of course, we can't expect you to understand what this means for hard-working families. You've left your daughters to be raised by North Star day camps. Do you even care about those girls? That's enough. And her arm reaches out, 
and her knuckles connect with his ribcage, and she lets it go. Only a tiny amount, really. It doesn't even knock him over. He staggers, his eyes go wide, he lets out a gasp, he takes one, two, three steps back from his podium and wraps his arms around his midriff. The audience have understood. Both those live in the studio and the folks back home. Everyone has watched and seen and understood what's happened. The crowd in the studio go very silent, as if they were holding their breath. And then there's a bubbling, gathering, discordant, roiling murmur rising higher and higher. The candidate tries to stumble on with his answer at the same moment that the moderator says they're taking a break, and Margot's expression changes from the angry, nose-curling victory of aggression to the sudden fear that what she's done cannot be undone. In the same instant that the studio audience's rising bubble of anger and fear and incomprehension turns into a mighty wail at the very same second that they cut to a commercial. Morrison makes sure that the candidate comes back from the commercial break, looking groomed and smoothed and poised, but not too perfect, maybe just a little shocked and saddened. They run a smooth campaign. Margot Cleary looks tired, wary. She apologizes more than once over the next few days for what happened. And her guys give her a good line to play. She's just so passionate about the issues, she says. It was unforgivable. But it was only when she heard Daniel Dandon lie about her daughters that she lost control. Daniel is statesmanlike about the whole thing. He takes the high ground. Some people, he says, find it tough to keep their composure in challenging situations. And although he admits his figures were mistaken, well, there's a right way and a wrong way to handle these things, isn't there, Kristen? He laughs. She laughs and puts her hand over his. There certainly is, she says. And now we have to go to commercial. When we come back, can this cockatiel name every president since Truman? The polling numbers say that people are in general appalled by Cleary. It is unforgivable and immoral. Well, it just speaks of poor judgment. No, they can't imagine voting for her. The day of the election, the numbers are looking strong, and Daniel's wife starts looking over those plans to renovate the governor's mansion arboretum. It's only after the exit polls that they start to think something might be wrong. And even then... I mean, they can't be this wrong, but they can. It turns out the voters lied. Just like the accusations they always throw at hard-working public servants, the goddamn electorate turned out to be goddamn liars themselves. They said they respected hard work, commitment, and moral courage. They said that the candidate's opponent had lost their vote the moment she gave up on reason, discourse, and calm authority. But when they went into the voting booths, in their hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, they thought, You know what, though? She's strong. She'd show them. In a stunning victory, says the blonde woman on the TV screen, one which has shocked pundits and voters alike. Morrison doesn't want to listen anymore, but can't make himself turn it off. The candidate is interviewed again. He's saddened that the voters of this great state did not choose to return him to office as their governor. But he bows before their wisdom. That's good. Don't give reasons. Never give reasons. They'll ask you why you think you lost. But never tell them. They're trying to back you into criticizing yourself. He wishes his opponent every success in office, and he'll be watching her every step of the way, ready to call her out if she forgets for a moment about the voters of this great state. Morrison watches Margot Cleary on the screen, now the governor of this great state, as she accepts her plaudits and says that she'll be a humble, hard-working public servant, grateful for the second chance she's been given. She also hasn't understood what's happened here. She thinks she needs to ask forgiveness, still, for the thing that brought her into office. She's wrong. Tunde. 
Tell me, says Tunde, what is it you want? One of the men on the protest line waggles his banner in the air. The banner reads, Justice for men. The others give out a rattling, ragged cheer and fetch another round of brewskis from the cooler. What it says, one of them opines, we want justice. Yes, the government did this, and the government has to put it right. It's a slow afternoon. The air is syrupy, and it's going to hit 104 in the shade out here. It is not the best day to be at a protest at a mall in Tucson, Arizona. He only came because he'd had an anonymous tip-off that something was going to happen here today. It had sounded pretty convincing, but it's panning out into nothing at all. Any of you guys involved with the internet at all? Batshitcrazy.com, Babe Truth, Urban Docs, any of that online stuff? The guys shake their heads. I saw an article in the newspaper, says one of them, a man who apparently decided to shave only the left half of his face this morning. Says that the new country, Vesapara, is chemically castrating all the men. That's what they're going to do to all of us. I don't think that's true, says Tunde. Look, I cut the piece out in the paper. The guy starts to rummage in his satchel. A bunch of old receipts and empty packets of chips tumble out onto the asphalt. Sheared, he says, and chases after his litter. Tunde films him idly on his camera phone. There are so many other stories he could be working on. He should have gone to Bolivia. They've proclaimed their own female pope. The progressive government in Saudi Arabia is starting to look vulnerable to religious extremism. He could be back there doing a follow-up on his original story. There are even gossip stories more interesting than this. The daughter of a newly elected governor in New England has been photographed with a boy. A boy, apparently, with a visible skein. Tunde's heard about this. He did a piece where he spoke to doctors about treating girls with skein deformations and problems. Not all girls have it. Contrary to early thinking, about five girls in a thousand are born without. Some of the girls don't want it, and try to cut it out of themselves. One of them tried with scissors, the doctor said. Eleven years old. Scissors. Snipping at herself like a paper-cut-out doll. And there are a few boys with chromosome irregularities who have it too. Sometimes they like it, and sometimes they don't. Some boys ask the doctors if they can have theirs removed. The doctor has to tell them no. They don't know how to do that. More than 50% of the time, if a skein is severed, the person dies. They don't know why. It's not a vital organ. The current theory is that it is connected to the electrical rhythm of the heart, and its removal disrupts something there. They can remove some of the strands of it, to make it less powerful, less noticeable, but once you have it, you've got it. Tunde tries to imagine what it'd be like to have one. A power you can't give away or trade. He feels himself yearning for it, repulsed by it. He reads online forums where men say that if all the men in the world had one, everything would be back the way it ought to be. They're angry and afraid. He understands that. Since Delhi, he's been afraid too. He joins SoxSpeaks.com under a pseudonym and posts a few comments and questions. He comes across a sub-forum discussing his own work. They call him a gender traitor there because he did that story about Awadi Atif rather than keeping it secret. And he's not reporting on the men's movement and on their particular conspiracy 